Hey guys, welcome to the 15th episode of the Learning Podcast. And if you aren't sure, it's a Singaporean podcast dedicated to learning something new from every single guest on this show. And today I have with me a friend I met through LinkedIn. His name is Royal. Ro- Royal. That's right. Royal. Royal. I think right. that name is yeah. like freaking like. Do you, have you ever met anyone with the same name as you? No, I no, haven't. Right? I haven't it's met anyone with Royal. For listeners out there, I think if you have an interest in cryptocurrency, the blockchain technology, or even the FMB industry in general, I think Roy Her can provide a lot of insights because um, yes. it's actually my first time meeting Royal and I mm-hmm. want to be able to learn a lot more about the crypto space, the Bitcoin and everything because I feel that at times it gets very technical. Right. And I feel like the kind of lingo that people use oh, is somehow very intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I myself have put in some money in blockchain and uh, Bitcoin as well, okay. Ethereum and all the other coins as well. So yes. maybe I think it will be helpful to maybe, or I'm not sure if your intent, or would you say that you want people that you believe that Bitcoin or crypto is an mm. asset worth investing in. Okay, but I'll, I'll go into that later. Yeah. And yeah, Royal, for those listeners that don't know who you are, could you give a backstory of who you are and right. where you come from? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. No, no, very thanks excited for coming, to be here. Yeah, I think it's, it's great. Um, ah. The setup is great. Listeners, I mean, you can't see this, but it's great here. Uh, so my name is Royal. I'm a portfolio manager at Queen Investment Partners. So what we do at the company is that we do investment into blockchain related companies, mm. cryptocurrencies, uh, as they are now the main assets that people are looking yeah. to get themselves exposed to if they're mm. looking at blockchain related companies mm. uh, because they don't get exposed to the, the direct buying into the companies itself. Mm. So uh, we do that. We have been in the space for a while now. Uh, Queen is part of a consulting group. Okay. That's our parent company. Mm. So uh, they do a lot of consulting for businesses and mm. I think back in three years before a lot of people started coming to Singapore to start up their own crypto project. Uh, mm. ICOs, they call it. Yes, I yes. Initial, initial coin offerings. Oh, nice. So uh, basically, it changes the way of how businesses raise money in mm. a very short term, uh, very simple manner. So basically, next, last time we wanted to buy into a company, uh, you have to wait for it to be publicly traded, maybe. Yeah. Then you sort of trade the shares, mm. or if not, you know someone you know who knows someone mm. who introduced to you some deals, mm. and then uh, yes, you get exposed. But I guess with ICOs, uh, that remove a lot of uh, that kind of a legal work behind it because now you are not offering shares, mm. you are offering Coins. a coin, yeah. right? Uh, which is like a utility coin. Mm. Think about it like a Starbucks card. Mm. Everybody can own a Starbucks card, mm. right? Uh, you don't own. Starbucks, if you own a Starbucks card. Yeah. Yeah. So that utility that the Starbucks card gives you is really just what you can get in Starbucks, mm. which is just like a cup of coffee and stuff like that. Mm. But because it was so speculative, people think that Starbucks card that they are holding right now mm. could be worth a lot more in the future. And someone will be willing to buy that Starbucks card at a much higher price because of the limited supply thing that they do to the coins and mm. stuff like that. Mm. So yes, yeah, such a big, that's ICO. So uh, a lot of projects are flowing in and as the company who was doing the consultancy for them, uh, we think that, hey, you know, maybe we can start looking into the space ourselves as mm. we were doing research and stuff like mm. that. Uh, yeah, so here we are today. We started trading. We started coming up with the right approach. So our company actually has like a trading algorithm. Mm. So we have moved on to a more quantitative way of looking at the markets today okay. and we, we do take in uh, accredited investors money yes definitely um, accredited they're accredited so the MAS will have little production over you because you sort of need to know what you're doing mm. and yeah so that's what we do we help people get exposed to the space and mm. uh, yeah that's uh, happening for about you know one and a half years for me mm. right now since I joined Queen uh, a little bit of my background I graduated from SMU mm. just last year and uh Econs, finance is like my background. Mm. So I'm always into financy stuff, mm. like uh, uh, banking, you know, investment banking, markets role, mm. kind of exposed to that. Yeah. Can, can we bring us back, right? Like when did your interest in crypto begin? Because at least from right. my perspective in NUS, right, right. I'm not sure if it's the same in, in, in uh, SMU, uh, a lot of finance friends are out there, IB, uh, investment banking, that kind of traditional route is more of the popular choice to go to. But yes. um, I know that you're very passionate about crypto, right? So when did that, interest uh, get to you. Right, right. I, I think for a lot of people, uh, they were first exposed to Bitcoin through headlines, yeah. meaning in, uh, so Bitcoin had a few speculative run yes, in 2015, yes. and the one that was, that was the high was in 2017. 2017. February, and I remember. <laughs> yes, so 2017 was actually, in fact, how I heard of Bitcoin. 
Mm. And a funny story because uh, I was actually preparing for uh, interviews for the banks. Yeah. Right, I was still trying to get into the banks at that moment. Mm. You know, still trying to to put what I studied in school to work. Mm. And the the interview question that we were that we were asked was, "What do you think of Bitcoin?" Oh, and that is when you know you know why are people. In well, the industry, even about thinking about that, so that is interesting to even uh, look at. So I was like, okay, maybe. So I need to do my homework, homework to prepare for the, for the interview. Right? And that's when I searched my first time. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Okay. And when I searched, body, I was just like, what is math? You say it's math back. It's like a digital currency. Yes, yes. It's virtual. You don't get to see it. And mm. but as I dive deeper into it, then I realized that we might be looking at something that has a chance mm. uh, to sort of. Uh, perform in the upcoming years, and that was how I got exposed to like cryptocurrencies. So and again, there are, there are friends who talks about it. Mm. You will have that colder friend yeah. that when Bitcoin was at four hundred dollars, yes, yes, and then say that hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? Uh, oh. Something that if you go and mine with your processing power, yeah. you sort of can earn Bitcoin, mm. like how you will mine gold physically by digging out the f- from the ground, refining it, and stuff like that. Mm. Hey, you want to look at this? Mm. And I guess a lot of people answer was no, you know, mm. like what is it? So I guess what really got me diving a little bit deeper was preparing for those interviews mm. and how could this asset, as they call it, fit into mm. uh, today's world. So the more that you research into it, you realize that wow, this is a interesting industry. Yes, but, I yes. Mean, at your when you graduated, like, was it were there like a lot of companies involved in this space like blockchain? Even, even for myself, I'm not, I'm really not familiar with the blockchain sure. uh, space in Singapore. Sure. So. Um, I won't say that there's a lot because mm-hmm. compare. I think in Singapore it's still like uh, domestic market size is still very small mm-hmm. in considering Singapore. So there and blockchain companies definitely don't have that budget to really you know have a program for graduates and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people were not exposed to that, and you have to really actively search for it if mm-hmm. you want. But there are a lot of companies once you type in the search, they are actually looking to hire. Mm-hmm. Um, in I think back in those days, mm-hmm. I'm talking about 2017, 2018, mm-hmm. where they managed to raise money with their ICOs. ICOs right? uh, they, they do actually have big budgets mm-hmm. that they allow them to do you know, marketing and how to do development of that. But mainly what they need is actually coders and developers and and that's okay. why I guess a lot of mainstream uh, people are not exposed to the job side of things of cryptocurrencies. Mm. Yeah. Can you share any? Because I I understand top level what is ICOs, right? Yes. It's the almost the equivalent of IPOs because I haven't heard a lot of good stories about ICOs in a sense whereby yeah. a lot of startups. I I mean I I individually know a startup founder and he's like not to, not that he said it directly but a, mm-hmm. a mutual friend of us said like they had an ICO which was sort of worth like 17 mi- 18 million dollars right that was normal okay. yeah so that yeah. was normal um is it right to say that it's very similar to IPO like what are the differences and how accountable does a company need to be to these coins and whether people are willing to buy wait people are buying them so, yeah. yeah, so you see, that's the million dollar question that MAS, yeah. everybody is trying to figure out what yeah. is this thing? Is act, is acting like a utility, like a Starbucks card example that I gave. But again, it seems to have let you have some equity of the business because if you hold the coins, you do get to know the, the, the project. How is it going? How's the business going? You, you do get to ask certain questions. And then there is the gray area, you see. People mm. don't know how to you know, sort of term it as like a security or term it as a utility kind yeah. of point of view. So even like Bitcoin, Ethereum, they do, uh, are still going ongoing cases. Mm. Now, Ethereum has been uh, now regulated as a utility. So you don't... You can use it. You can use it because you, um, for the listeners out there that don't know what Ethereum is, uh, basically like a computing... Uh, blockchain mm. that allows people to write smart contracts on it. So again, smart contract can be another very hefty word that you don't mm. understand, mm. Uh, but it's just very simple if and then condition. Oh. Meaning if I buy into something, I get dividend, mm. right? So last time, right, you have people, really office people looking at, yes, JJ bought this, he gets dividend, mm. let me mail the dividend to him, let me pay him out. There's this middle part that mm. is not automated. Mm. Ethereum allows you to write smart contract mm. in that sense. If JJ own this, record on the blockchain, then give it's dividend. Automated. It's automated. So that's why you hear a lot of stories about blockchain taking away the middleman job. Mm. Yeah, so I might have sidetracked a bit <laughs> to, to, to explain what a okay. smart contract is. Uh, but the question is, what's the difference between ICO and IPO? Yes. They can't be the same thing because IPO faces uh, 
um, for those listeners out there who, who, who knows about the process of investment banking, mm. you know investment banks are the ones that take your companies public. Yes. Yes, so they do valuation for you, how much you are worth, how much your shares trade at, mm. and if nobody buys your IPO, they, they, who are going to be your backers, who are going to be your sponsors, make sure that you, you do, you know, sort of do that valuation for yeah. your company. So for ICO, we don't have all these investment bankers. Okay. So who does those valuation is from the air. Right, so who is it from the air? Like the market decides the value. The the project owners decide. Okay. And once the coin is sort of traded, then the market takes it over, mm. right? Like how an IPO shares where they are, when you know, for example, Uber go public and then people start trading Uber stocks, right? Uh, the market sort of decides that so fair value. So I see the company says, okay, I'm going to release like fifty thousand uh, coins. Exactly, our, this our own is. Coins. Then you just let the market decide how much do they want to buy it for. Yeah, yeah. You let it float in the market. I mean, you you could have a predetermined price that uh, you you, you deem the price a base cap or a something. base. Yes, and again, you see, then you can see the problem right now, right? Uh, there there are no bankers helping you do that valuation, which have been de- they have been doing for a long while now. The number of coins that you decide to let it trade and everything is really decided by the project owners. Is there like a platform which all of this exists? Like you, 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 you can set up your own I- oh, okay, coin right the- now. Oh. Uh, yes, with all these Ethereum, the power of the smart contracts again, you okay. could write, you could base on the Ethereum net blockchain network okay. and launch your own coin. Mm. We, we could do a JJ coin right now. So, okay, a company A releases 50,000 coins. Like the company decides what utility can be exchanged for those coins. They decide what kind of uh, so when you own again. That's why I like to use the Starbucks card example. It, yeah, Starbucks I, li- I like is, it. It makes it simpler. Yeah, Starbucks sells coffee. Yes. If you have a Starbucks card, you can buy coffee. You can buy coffee. That is a utility use. That's a utility. Yes. Then the other one you were talking about is ownership of the company, which is which is different. shares, yeah, right? Which is shares, if, right? Because you see, if you own a share of a company, those who have invested, uh, you know, they send to you like shareholder reports, yeah, yeah. like what's the how, how's the company gonna move forward for the upcoming years and stuff like that. So, uh, in that, do you get that when you buy a Starbucks card? No. Yeah. Don't. So that's the clear difference. Like uh, people are selling as like a utility. Be- why aren't they not doing that? Because in order for you to do that, which is sell equity of a company, issue shares to shareholders and stuff like that, there's a lot of regulation going involved. Mm. Like there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of people that needs to be involved. Investment bankers, lawyers. The sizable capital lawyers are expensive. Exactly. All kind of cost. So when people start to realize, I could start up a company. I want to raise money. I could. You know, next time if you, I could do an ICO. I mean, if you want to support me, my so company. So it's up to your marketing collaterals. Out exactly. There, whatever content you put out there, we are a company that is going to, like. Is this some like we are gonna use this 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 uh with your money and in exchange with those coins that you buy from us, we you give you can, the coins. Oh, we give you the coins. You give us the 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 money, um, like then, in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, Mm. And then you raise that money and then you do you, you develop your project, your mm. business and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. So I guess it's a little bit hard to grasp the concept, right? But think of it as like a new way to raise funds. Mm. Uh, and that was what r- was radical about the 2017 run up. Mm. Because um, every person could literally go onto the website, you know, go to the Ethereum blockchain, start up their own company in that sense and then issue their own coin and that is why you see a lot of this project coming out mm. and you can't use monetary values or fiat money they call it to invest in these projects okay yeah so that's why people were buying bitcoin and ethereum and those projects owners okay. were accepting bitcoin and ethereum in exchange for their, for their coins which is printed out of thin air okay and you, you see yeah. how this can drive up the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum because in order for me to buy into JJ coin today, mm. what do I need to do? I need to use my money, don't uh, put it into the bank, get it over to a US bank. I buy Bitcoin or Ethereum back in 2017 and then I use Ethereum to buy JJ coin. Mm. And then that is why you see a lot of people buying Ethereum and Bitcoin. Mm. And that is the run up you see. Bitcoin to 20, I mean, it sounds like this is a, a very good thing that you can just raise money. But is there any, from your experience, like what is the negative thing compared to IPOs? Um, again, or it's the process the, because the because of the process that the IPO goes through, right? 
there almost isn't a lot of fraud cases mm. in that sense, right? Because you got to have lawyers, so much paperwork, so much time. paperwork, so much capital just to raise fund mm. for to to do an IPO for your company, and you you see the floodgate that that opens up when when you have ICO. Anybody could sell a dream, as long as I'm using blockchain, those big words, mm. I could you know m- do excellent marketing and then sell my coin. Mm. There were. 90% the 90% of the companies that actually raised ICOs in 2017 were fraud. Were fraud. They were fraud. My god, then can you imagine the the the, the amount of uh, money that flow in so quickly and the money the the, the 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 price of your coin will go up every day, they will jump. Yeah. And once the owner decided that hey, you know, pangkang, pangkang done. Then the and who are you going to go after? Like yeah. are you going to call the police? No, uh Okay, so who are they? Oh, they they started thinking, They asked me to give them Bitcoin and Ethereum, and you you see where this whole thing goes. Yes, it's not yes. protected by the proper regulation. Mm. So as uh, so I would say that that's really one of the biggest con. It opens the floodgate to fraud. And then why would people want to? Because there are companies who are actually legitimate, right? Because the ten percent of companies if you, that are really yes, if you think about it, funding is a pain, pain right? It's a pain. <laughs> It's a pain in the ass. And uh, if you're like a SME, you have run your own business, you know, it's difficult to get a loan these days, you know, uh, you need to have record, you know, what your company doing, you want to get it from the bank, you're going to pay interest. There was a lot of process mm. uh, going to getting this capital that you need to start up your business. Mm. If you are a legitimate business, if you really have a very good idea, and actually that funding process actually stopped you from launching your idea, that's mm. a pretty big pity, right? Mm. But if you now you could raise it through a coin and you are really providing a service to the people, you really want to build something, mm. it could actually be a very good thing. Yeah. So that I guess is what started this whole ICO thing. A few companies that have started then are still around today. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, those are companies that we probably should take a look at. Mm. And those, you know, that <laughs> Frauds. Uh, fraud I mean the it's pretty obvious if you if you do your due diligence. Yeah, so, so what are the kind of due diligence would you I mean, advise people that are considering to invest into ICOs. Okay, so my first advice, my first advice is uh, if you uh, don't know about Bitcoin, you don't know what Ethereum is, uh, probably it's not a good idea to look at ICOs. Okay. So think about it like an internet dot com burst, right? uh, Back in the 1990s or like close to the 2000s, Mm. right? There were a lot of internet companies. Internet was the thing that people were talking about. Yes. Hey, email, oh. stuff like that. And social network. So that, that actually gave the rise of the, the internet stocks bubble, mm. they call it. And uh, it burst, right, from a 7 trillion kind of industry back to 1 trillion, representing like an 80 to 90% correction in the price. A lot of the companies were gone. Mm. Um, but what was left from that ashes, oh. we could see is company like Amazon, yeah. company like Google mm. and stuff like that. Mm. So this is exactly what we are seeing right now in the crypto space. And that is why it's exciting. Go understand what blockchain is. Um, do you really believe uh, what blockchain can do, which is like maybe uh, solve middleman, take out middleman from, and, what, and then what kind of industry needs kind of this kind of uh, service. Mm. And then if you have certain industry in your mind, then you can look at what those projects are trying to sell you. Is it does it you know align with what you think the problems could be solved? For example, supply chain. I'll give yes. one example. Supply chain could be saved. Uh, a lot of money could be saved because there is a lot of inefficiency in in sort different of different systems from different exactly. Countries. So if um, you think supply chain can be a problem that can be solved by blockchain, mm. then look at those projects that are doing uh, supply chain solution using blockchain. And that sort of filters through the many, many ICOs that you are looking at today. Today, we have like 3,000 coins. 3,000 coins. Exactly how are you going to choose? Understand what Bitcoin is. That's the first advice. What Ethereum is. If you like the story of this bigger cryptocurrencies, has been around, Bitcoin has been around for 11 years. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that. 11 years, Bitcoin turned... I thought it was around only about like five years. It, it, yeah, it came into attention okay. about five years. But it really... The, the white paper... Uh, came out after the financial crisis in 08. Mm. Yeah, that's when people don't want to trust the central banks. banks. And that is the, this whole rise of alternative money, mm. Bitcoin sort of 
uh, give birth to this idea mm. and then it has been around for 11 years mm. so today I think it takes uh, I'm not sure of the exact math but I think it takes approximately 1 to 2 billion dollars to hack 1 bitcoin because hack. to hack 1 bitcoin okay. so go and understand how a blockchain works how this public distributed public ledger works and then you can understand ethereum which is uh, using the same sort of like technology but you know allowing people to code on it Mm. So writing those smart contracts like I mentioned, mm. and then you can go on to like you need technical projects. people to be able to code on it. Yes, like software developers. Yes, if you don't have the expertise. You so need to get someone with the expertise, right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not asking you to create your own coin or okay. like. Uh, so again, when you people that, um, so those who have been watching Gary knows that he's involved in certain company at a very early stage okay. investor. So you don't really need to know how the tech works. Right? You need to know that this is legitimate in certain sense that, hey, uh, listen to experts. There were a lot of talks on, on, on how crypto or how blockchain works. Mm. And then you pick again, like, what do you think are the problems that the industry and the world is facing today? And then you see the companies that are solving these problems. And then if you really think that there is a pain point, and there is a solution you can reach out it's a very practical thing it is it's a very practical it thing. has to be and so you, mm, you wouldn't recommend let's say if i don't know the industry of logistics for instance then yes it's best for me not to go into those icos because 100%. i don't fully really understand it to to go into supply chain icos project and and that is a beautiful part because yeah. everybody's in their own industry and yeah. only you are in your own industry you see the pain point Something like you, hey, you know, you're working with so many people on this middle, um, like for example, trade financing is one of the, those big problems that could be solved by blockchain, uh, food traceability. Yes. How do you know the plate of hala food on your table is hala? Yeah. How? Blockchain. You could be on a blockchain. Yeah. Now if he has a QR code, I scan, I can know exactly which how it was prepared. Which farm? And, and this is traceability. And again, that could be one problem that can be solved by blockchain. Mm. And if you are in that industry, mm. if you are doing uh, authenticity of like products, how do you know this LV bag is real? Mm. There's kind of uh, authenticity. So let's, let's say there's this third party company that specializes in letting you know where your origins of your bag come from then, yeah then you will want to buy into the ic of this company because um it, it, it lets you know basically. yeah so again that's just step one right okay. because step one you know that there's a problem in the industry that okay. could be solved by blockchain okay step two look for those companies with those solutions potential solution step three will be to really understand what their solution is going to so be can i step back the back step <laughs> can i step to go to step two yeah how do you find like these companies like you, you just need to rely on their organic marketing or their ways of reaching potential consumers that will want to invest in their icos because yes, I so mean, you can't really find these companies, right? So go to coinmarketcap.com. Okay, coinmarketcap.com. Coinmarketcap.com, okay. and you can see all the listed coins, listed coins that you can actually buy. Why do you mean listed coins? Because they're not listed. Oh, not they're listed not IPO. Yet. Okay. They're not IPOs, they're ICOs, okay, right? Listed is a like on the li yeah, listed on the, okay, on okay. the website, okay, right? Yeah. Listed. yeah. Okay, okay. So once you uh, sort of see that, you click into the project they will have a white paper. So what is a white paper? White paper simply tells you how the project timeline, what the project uh, comes about, who are the team members, what are they trying to do, the problem they're trying to solve. This white paper exists for all projects. If the project doesn't have a white paper, it's time to, you know, get out, right? The number one. Number one, right? Are, are there listed coins with no white papers? I don't think so, right? Um, I mean, you'll be surprised in 2017, there is anything with an idea and very... Uh, well, how do I say limited effort put together kind of like you a can white, white paper yeah and everybody at the moment wasn't looking and doing their due diligence they was they were ready to just put money, Throw in, money. into the next Amazon yeah right and everybody is getting excited about that yeah. and and I think that is the part where if you are not an investor and you'll be like hey you know uh, I, but I you know I do want to make some money by investing in cryptocurrencies and blockchain do take some time to understand it. And I think for a lot of people, uh, because when you invest your money into something, uh, I think it, it works for equities, which is like businesses, bonds, real estate. You need to understand. But if you are putting your money in a company which is like equities, uh, you, are, you know the company is going to be there. Mm. right? But for blockchain, uh, with a lot of those projects, those ICOs, you, are, you, are, you don't know if they are going to be there. Mm. So 
get to know the team members, research them on, on, on Google, right? Mm. The team is there. You, you LinkedIn, go on LinkedIn, find out those. Are they doing stuff, right? What are their background? Mm. So I think what really reassured me was uh, the, the, the project that I invested in, the projects, like supply chain projects, the team members were from like DHL. Mm. This kind of FedEx, this or kind of companies. They have like real experience. Yes, and this is exactly coincide with what I was saying just now, right? Industry, they work in the industry for very long. There are people of a high position there. They they can see the pain point. They are frustrated by a particular problem. That's why they, they want to, and 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 that is the way. Yeah, and and that gives me a lot of credential. And if like the short term, kind of. Uh, fluctuation and volatility that you see in the markets you'll be assured that you are investing actually in someone who has mm. the expertise mm. yeah again that is just a very basic screener of course there are a lot of other things and my advice will be really not to try not to jump into any investments uh, really try to understand what blockchain is first which essentially it is just a database <laughs> okay. and, and it's a lot of big fancy word uh, out there. It's just a database that is maintained by a group of network of people that is, uh, you see that group of people, so it's not centralized. Meaning centralization means that, uh, for example, if you use like AWS services, the single point of failure will be obviously Amazon. Yes. Right? If they, their database got compromised, somehow your data will be lost and stuff. Mm. But for, for, for example, things like Bitcoin, when everyone in the world is mining Bitcoin, maintaining the network is very difficult to hack because they don't have a single point of failure. Mm. So at this point, if you're like struggling to keep up uh, with some of this knowledge, uh, it's really not tough. YouTube, there is a five minutes video explaining how Bitcoin works. Yeah. Five minutes, mm. you know, watch it twice maybe. Mm. And then you will really have a very good idea, a much, much better idea of what Bitcoin actually is. Mm. And then, trust me, when you invest your money into something, you, you want to know what you're investing in. Yes. Yes, and uh, you don't have to dive deep. Just like how people that have invested in Amazon doesn't really know what Amazon, how the tech runs behind it, but they know they were trying to solve a lot of problems. Amazon was like a bookstore, how they shifted their business model, what they were trying to do. If you can understand that, if you can you know, align your values with those founders who founded the companies, then I think it would be a good bet after all. So you're talking about the 90% of fraud, right? And then it seems to me that the advantage that people that do ICO right is that they don't have to be like fully accountable to the people that give them the money. So yes, like, is that the biggest advantage? Because it seems like let's say if I buy into a coin, if the founder disappears, that's it. Yeah, like, it just, that's it. It just ends there. Isn't it very to the end consumer who is investing, right? So it, it's more the responsibility of the person investing to do their homework? To, yes, for you to do your own due diligence about mm. why you're investing. Uh, for, for, for listeners out there that have played games and you know about gift cards and stuff like that. For example, Spotify gives card, mm. uh, Starbucks card again, all this kind of card. If the company were to go away, can you take your Starbucks card somewhere and say, refund me my money? Cannot. No, yeah. And that is the exact loophole that this fraudulent people are going after oh. they know that even if they take your money you are you you bought into their starbucks card mm. you bought into their to their gift cards mm. with a promise of a dream mm. that you were people will be willing to pay more for their card because it's limited in supply mm. there is no obligation for them to do anything so the main responsibility will lie on people who are throwing their money out yes and and because they accepted bitcoin and ethereum Mm. And that changes the game, right? Because you buy your Ethereum, you just pass your Ethereum or your Bitcoin to them. Mm. So, but again, a lot of uh, obviously uh, regulators are going after these companies because it is still fraud, yeah. right? Ultimately, yeah. it is still fraud. But it's difficult to catch because those projects is borderless, mm. right? Mm. It could be a, a China mainland project that you have bought into. Mm. Can you see because of this cross border thing that cryptos allow mm. of cross border transaction? I have the I have the Bitcoin. You have the wallet. I can send it to you. Mm. Doesn't matter if you are in India, US, or where. So this cross border kind of transaction allow people to raise money literally from everywhere. Mm. How are the regulators going to keep up? So, let's say if I'm like a founder in China, right, I raise a lot of money. So it's my it's my freedom and decision to say, okay, maybe every six months I'm going to like release a shareholder re- uh, a shareholder report to all my coin. Uh, it's up to you. It's, it's up to you, right? Yes. 
the because disruptive. again, you are selling a card, a utility token. You are not selling parts of your company. So again, of course, the regulators are not stupid, right? Oh. They have caught up and uh, they are going after these companies. And the minute these company now, you know, try to raise uh, ICO or something, they will be like, hey, you know what? Actually, what you are trying to do here represents very closely to a securities. You know, it it seems like you are selling equities of the company. Mm. And you are not allowed to do that, mm. and and we see, and that is why the ICO stories that you heard was in 2017, 2018, mm. start of 2018. Mm. Right now, there is a, in having being being in the industry, there is no much ICOs going on mm. because people know that the regulators are now watching. Mm. So projects that have survived over the past two years or four years or even two years, three years, sorry, no four years, so they are legitimate project that's really trying to build a product mm. to sell so uh, it's safe to say that now the projects that are coming out is less likely to be a fraud mm. because of the nature of the industry where people are actually watching mm. and people are actually learning from the experiences in 2017 and 2018 yeah yeah so i think that is a uh, uh, something to, to be <laughs> relieved about mm. and you know what they have all telegram chats that they can join in to talk to the owners about the founders themselves. They will be on the Telegram chat. But that term is decided on the company that raises the IFC. Uh, yes, IFC, and right? but it was you, you can see like how free market works into this kind of thing, right? For example, there are five projects for you to choose from, mm. right? Four projects tells you that you can talk to the founders. And the fifth one said, No, you can't. Will you invest in the fifth one? Probably not. So it's the nature of like people are trying to raise funds, people are trying to really do something. So uh, the free market will sort of correct itself and give it certain standards. So now they, in fact, they don't even give six month report. The 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 team, whenever there is an update about the the blockchain project, will give an update in the Telegram chat. Mm. And I think that is something to, uh, that is satisfying and to uh, reassuring mm. and to, to to know about in for today. Is it context. common practices for companies who do ICOs so like when you say raise? 18 million dollars right today is 18 million dollars worth of bitcoin and ethereum yes and like it's i mean i would say it's common practice for them to cash everything out is it oh you'll be shocked right uh, because yeah, yeah, how, yeah how, how does this so, go about? um so for real companies that are building a real product it is it makes sense like yeah. you figure it out for them to cash out on their bitcoin and ethereum into fiat money US dollar, Chinese dollar. Fiat money, just money. Right? It's just okay, paper okay. money. Paper okay, money. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's just paper money. Okay. Fiat, fiat money, just paper money. Uh, it makes sense for them to cash out so that they can pay their coders, they can pay their developers, they can do more marketing, they can you know build a real product. Mm. But that is not the case. Okay. And because Bitcoin and Ethereum is so powerful, it is on the blockchain and it's public ledger that everyone can view, you can really know how much money the project owners are keeping in their wallet. You can track it. Oh, raise eighteen million worth of Bitcoin. This amount of X Bitcoin, X Bitcoin has this money flowing out. You can track where is it flowing out. That's the beauty and of. I mean, the, the you only can track it to a point where it's converted to cash, right? Uh, you track it to an exchange, for example. Okay, so and to an exchange to a bank. Yep, to a bank, then I will take out money. I guess you you don't have the exact. Uh, sort of like flow. a like a flow uh, you you have the flow you don't ha- have the exact things of where they spend the cash right yeah, because yeah. what i guess that's where you're oh, yeah, going yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. after they sell for cash mm. but you don't know what they do you know they be- can they can go and buy a lamborghini you know <laughs> a ferrari but that is very hard to proceed because if you are ki- if you are keep if you are burning money and your project is not developing then that's when you, it's a red alert, right? Yeah. It's a red tape that, hey, this company mm. is not good, right? And you, they have like a timeline for their progress of their project. Mm. And uh, actually, to be honest, some good projects are really, you know, uh, spending money to, to re- really cash in on the developers. Mm. On, on building, And you can track the number of developers working on their code. It's all open source. Mm. And that is why blockchain is so radical in changing the the way about funding comes about and stuff that's like something that. that ipo doesn't provide uh, i mean in a probably I mean, in a not extent, because you got to trust the company to put their, the money i mean they have like a shareholders report yeah but not hey, actually do, do i actually my, I myself i'm not very familiar with this yeah they do they, they tell you how much cash they have how much mm. asset they have for example let's break it down to simple terms like oh uh an fmb okay you know uh how many employees uh, you know how many how much money they have in cash their revenue and stuff like that mm. so that is uh reassuring you're saying that they don't really cash out why is that 
Oh yes, yeah, yeah, you'll yeah, be surprised. Point, right? uh, imagine put yourself in the shoe of a project owner, right? You have just raised fifty Bitcoin, for example. How much is that worth? Uh, doesn't matter. Okay, okay, okay? <laughs> for assuming it is five thousand okay. dollars, okay, you have raised fifty Bitcoin, five thousand dollars. Great, you're happy. You're ready to kickstart your project. Yeah. Right. And to you, so you you were happy. You were sleeping, and the next day you wake up. Bitcoin is at six thousand dollars. You are essentially how much richer now? A thousand times fifty. Yeah. So can you see where I'm going? So they they keep it keep it based on the fluctuations. They keep it for the speculative incremental value of the Bitcoin asset. And like you should know where I'm going now. Like all things, it comes it goes up and it comes back yeah. down. Uh, you raise fifty Bitcoin today. You go to sleep tomorrow. You wake up. It is. One thousand dollars. Yeah, your budget is essentially cut by eighty percent. Yeah, so I guess it should be a mix, right? If the project owners has a very we call it bullish, we should be thinking that the market is going up. A bullish view on the on 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 these coins, it is still. Uh, they must still exercise certain conscience and know that they are they need to feed their developers. They need to you know they need to pay for uh, a balance capital uh expenditure, which is like buying machines and stuff like that. They need to balance that. And mm. for me, as a uh, portfolio manager, I, I like to see project cashing out. Mm. I like to see them spending instead of like you raise 50 million and then now you're keeping it in Bitcoin in hoping that Bitcoin will go up. So yeah. what are you doing? So that's quite ridiculous. Yes. It? So okay. uh, yeah, so that's one, one metric that anybody could actually easily track mm. uh, to see what the project is actually doing. Mm. And, uh, and so it seems that we have shifted uh, the whole conversation to be like, ICOs, right? Oh, yeah. To ICOs, and I think what uh is important to take a step back and look at the whole industry as a whole. Mm. That, firstly, Bitcoin is not blockchain. Mm. Uh, Bitcoin operates on a blockchain, mm. so a lot of uh solutions can be developed on a blockchain because of uh, uh innovation called Ethereum okay. that allows you to write uh conditions and smart contracts mm. on the blockchain that is available for everyone to see and that spurs a lot of projects and that is why this whole space um, 90 percent of the companies were fraudulent and that is why there's a very dark picture painted on this and if you have been following bitcoin if you have not been following bitcoin you must have also heard of the silk road cases where bitcoin was used to purchase gun uh, purchase uh, cocaine mm. purchase drugs and and because uh, it's cross-border yeah. transaction ability uh, allows people to really sort of do that but if you just think about it right if everything is so legit on the blockchain and it's so it's recorded so clearly right why would you use bitcoin to buy something illegal yeah <laughs> why would you do that mm. the best way is still cash yeah. because nobody knows who <laughs> and where the you spend from. the cash come from so uh, cash is still the best way to do, to, illegal do, things. to do illegal things uh, Bitcoin allows you to do because for example you are trying to buy a, a, a huge batch of guns from China from uh, India from US I'm just going to put all the names out there so I'm not biased <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, you want to send that money in you, you have to pay a credit card and the credit card company know what you are spending on and stuff like that so it's difficult mm. so if you are sending Bitcoin the company could uh, set Bitcoin that transaction goes right through so people were using that to just you know I'm just going to pay for it and since uh, no regulators knows about Bitcoin I don't think they can figure out regulators the Regulators in the sense whereby they'll look at the kind of transactions Yes So yes. previously there was no one looking It was there but no one was looking No one cared no one because cared. it was so small Oh. Right, Un until more and more people start to use Bitcoin to buy this kind of uh, illegal stuff, and that is why the re regulators and the policemen, the, the feds, they all caught up, and 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 that's why we see a stop to that. And in fact, now if you really know and understand how it works, you know it's very stupid to, to use Bitcoin to pay for illegal stuff because mm. you'll be forever on the ledger that everybody can see. Mm. Yeah, so it's not a good idea. To You're sharing more about the origins of bitcoin right yes. and you think that it is actually more important for people to understand the macro perspective of this could you share more about that so maybe how bitcoin works in a very few sentences la. no oh, i won't say sentences? i won't even say like one sentence okay uh, everybody know what's pay now and pay now yes correct so if uh, now i'm going to pay now 
Thanks. Pay now JJ $5. Yeah. Right? Mine account were minus five. Mm. JJ account were plus five. That's how JJ knows he has received the $5. Mm. Right? And who is keeping track of this minus five plus five? DBS. DBS. A central system. point. A central point of uh, end system. DBS is, you know, having these supercomputers updating. This is a ledger. Royal minus five, JJ plus five. Mm. This ledger, everybody just keep transferring money here and there and DBS updates it. Mm. So for Bitcoin case, instead of everybody, uh, instead of one party acknowledging and updating this transaction, the whole world that is mining this Bitcoin mm. approves that. So everybody updates Royal minus five, JJ plus five. Like for this single transaction, it's not necessary for the whole world to prove it like is it like only based on 15 first like i'm not like is it what do you mean 15 first sorry because i remember i think my brother was buying a product like for some from somewhere so uh-huh. then he used ethereum to buy it yeah then uh, for it to go through it like it only needs to have like 20 approvals yeah. first initially yeah and yeah. after that it'll go on and on so whole, right? yeah exactly when when the, when the transition get approved right you get locked so think of it as like a that's what it's called a blockchain. For example, Royal minus five, JJ plus five transaction got recorded in a block. Mm. And that's and the other, before a new transaction could be made, right? Uh, I don't know if, the, can they see this visual thing or the- uh, can, can, I can put a visual there. Yeah. Okay, so there is like a block or transaction, Royal minus five, JJ plus five. And in the next transaction that comes up, right? Uh, in order for it to be validated, uh, think of this block here as like a fingerprint. Right, a uh, part of the transaction needs to be verified b- via the previous transaction. Mm. So only when it matches, mm. then this transaction will be locked, mm. and they will be linked together. Mm. That's why it's called a blockchain. Oh, okay. Right, Literal. and then there is another block of transaction. Mm. So now, if someone tries to be funny, and try to say that hey, Royal didn't send five dollars to JJ, mm. uh, Royal actually sent ten. Mm. What he needs to do, right, is not to just alter this block. Because every block is chained together, yeah. what he needs to do is to change every block. Yeah. Because the minute you alter anything on a single block, the fingerprint that I'm talking about is different. Mm. So that is what makes a blockchain very secure mm. and very difficult to hack. And the, the longer it's operating, mm. the harder it is to hack. Mm. Yeah. So I guess uh, if that's just like very simple mm. analogy, obviously there's more, yeah, yeah. more stuff that goes into it, like the algorithm, the, the hash and everything. So. Uh, but that analogy explains why Bitcoin is secure mm. and why this and then you ask a very important question just now like then why do we need the whole world to update one transaction right isn't yeah. it like inefficient yeah. but th- we, 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 are, we are trying to put more value into security if everybody update, like updates it it's very difficult for anyone to tamper with the thing yes. now we all trust DBS because we, we know there's no incentive for DBS to take our money and run. But that is why it goes, goes back to your question of origin, right? It's because in 08, we see banks fail. Yeah. We see banks taking up too much leverage. We see banks take selling products that they're not supposed to sell. And th- I'm talking about the subprime mortgage crisis, mm. uh, which is like the collateral debt obligation. So they are selling things that we see bankers doing unethical practices mm. and banks do fall like the Lehman Brothers. Mm. We live in Singapore, so we are very fortunate to not have been through yeah. a crisis like that. Mm. But that that is what caused the birth of uh, Bitcoin, mm. like an alternative. That is a solution. There, there can be a solution mm. that, although it's not fast, because everybody updates the thing, mm. it might not be the fastest or instant, but we are actually, the industry actually is working on a solution for the blockchain to be faster. Mm. And... Uh, a lot of companies are actually one the, the one of the world uh, like the best people from co- uh, coders from like Google from like Amazon from like uh, those big internet companies are moving towards the blockchain space and that is what I'm actually seeing from my job to work on solution like this how do we make the Bitcoin uh, I won't mention Bitcoin like maybe the cryptocurrency transaction network faster and more secure mm. so it, the endpoint will be an alternative payment system mm. that has no central point of failure. Mm. And that is the story of like Bitcoin, I guess. Yeah. Can I move on to your job as a portfolio manager? Yes, like Queen's okay. Envi- Queen's investment. Queen's right? investment partners, yeah. Well, so basically you manage, you have certain clients mm-hmm. that are interested. Correct me if anytime. Yeah, sure, sure. You have certain clients that have 
a sizable amount of money that they want to put into the crypto space yeah, mm-hmm. into buying coins you would say or uh, like how do you ma- how do you manage their portfolio what kind of asset, uh, assets like so do you, basically your whole portfolio will have certain allocation of coins for certain yes. clients based on their risk appetite right so uh, what we do here is not like a customized solution for every investor mm. so what they are actually investing is into me and my team mm. Uh, so the team of four of us, we are actually working on creating a There's portfolio. There's only four of you in this company. Yes. Wow. Because I think, the, firstly, we all specialize in what we do. Mm-hmm. So I just a very quick brief. Uh, I, I myself manage a portfolio. I decide on some of the trading strategies. Um, we have a head of tech, which uh, you know highest developers handle the tech side. Because again, like I mentioned, we are moving towards a trading algorithm mm-hmm. kind of approach rather than making discretionary calls or like just uh, having manual traders trading mm. we are trading using code use mm. via trading bots we call them uh, we have another partner uh, whose name is Sophie she's a uh, investment banking background for like 10 years yeah. so she knows how the finance uh, market works she knows how to sell the funds she knows how to you know what kind of investors needs this kind of service uh, and sort of she does that you know, sort of the servicing and the funding part of the, the business mm-hmm. and then we have Clarence uh, who, who sort of manage uh, who, who is an associate portfolio manager with me so he does more like a market intelligence kind of thing going on the ground doing due diligence if we invest in a project I want to meet the project owners can we do that uh, so a lot of uh, value from there as well so we come together pretty nicely uh, me from like a trading background uh, the, my CTO is John and then Sophie and Clarence we come together mm-hmm. and then we, we put on we put a portfolio together to, to sort of let investors invest in to get exposure to cryptocurrency and doesn't want that volatility mm. because you want to put the money with someone who has some expertise in this project and they have been in the space for we are all in the space for like three four years from now uh, we have seen the ups and downs the ups and downs what works and what doesn't work and uh, we come together to, to sort of provide that solution mm. for clients who wants a piece of this action mm. but doesn't know how Mm. and they're like oh you know I, I, I really want to you know try to seek some returns in this cryptocurrency market but how should I do it uh, I'm, I, should I just buy and hold Bitcoin but Bitcoin is like moving so it's so volatile you know I'm worried so coming to us like a professional fund house then we, we sort of provide that, that sort of solution for you so investors come to you they tell you like they want a piece of this action and yep. basically assess the kind of risk appet- risk, ac- <laughs> risk appetites that they want mm-hmm. their objectives mm-hmm. and like do you meet every week just to go through, like how's the life of okay. clients like so every week I run through I send you a report of what we've been doing we meet up face to face how's the client interaction like? yes so it, it can it can be weekly yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'm not sure I'm really yeah, not so, sure uh, maybe just a very simplified version of what's going to happen for example uh, I will share with you my strategy mm. how, how, how I intend to sort of make money mm. uh, from cryptocurrencies blockchain related companies and investment that we think are good mm. uh, for the future and you, you after identifying that strategy to you you manage it on your own meaning you see how it fits to your other investments because people uh, they had they, they, our clients have their own businesses yes. they, they had invested in for example real estate they have their own stocks portfolio mm. so we don't you know want take everything over and say that you know we this manage everything a for small you portion of your yes other and assets. they come to us for this diversification play yeah. they want it they want a piece again they want a real piece of crypto mm. so this is my crypto strategy mm. are you interested yes I am okay uh, so once you have invested in me we send you a monthly report of how the fund is doing and after the initial six months sort of locked up period uh, with us you have like quarterly redemption period so anytime after the six months you know we, you have monthly performance update and quarterly you can decide if you want to put out mm. and put in more money and stuff like that yeah. does, the ch- does the company mainly charge on a retainer monthly basis or report basis or quarterly basis like how do you guys Charge. So in the in the hedge fund industry, uh, we call it the uh, two twenty rule, which is we take a um, a fees of two percent every year mm. of the amount that you have invested, mm. and twenty percent of the profit will come to us, and you take eighty percent. So for example, you invest hundred dollars in us, uh, that's two percent management fee taken uh, in a year, mm. and so it's two percent. Okay. That's two dollars, and if we make for example hundred dollars for you. We get to keep twenty, and you keep eighty. So this model, like 
it's only charged every year. Um, so so this this performance yeah. right every quarter we will do or so we call it like a crystallization oh, okay. so in that in that quarter mm. for example you start off again with a hundred dollars your your uh, and it's three months later you you now have uh two hundred dollars mm. so we will say that hey you know you can reinvest that amount that you have earned mm. you can actually redeem it or you can but we are taking that twenty dollars oh, okay. but there is a very important thing here to know is that we have a thing called high water benchmark which means that you know then the benchmark now is set at two hundred dollars mm. meaning three months later for example we lose back ten dollars mm. we then then another three months we lose back another ten dollars and then we make thirty dollars and we are back to two hundred mm. right uh, we are not going to take profit oh. twenty percent because the the now in order for us to take our performance fee mm. we need to beat that two hundred mark yeah yeah Oh, so it's very yeah. performance-driven. You're always yes. motivated to do the yes. best. Yes, and that is why this uh, sort of system works for the investors because it, it has their best interest, mm. right? We are not going to, you know, let your account floats oh, up I thought and it's down. Like the maximum profit, then even though it drops, right, you still take that profit. Oh, it's no, like we that. don't. Yeah, we, we, we have the benchmark. Mm. So we, we have to continuously outperform ourselves. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, I mean, I mean that is the, the, the standard of the, the, mm. the hedge fund industry. Mm. So when let's say I'm a client, yep. I pass you a certain amount of money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm let's say the client says I, do you, let's say I my background is mm. only like in the media advertising space. Yeah. So in the kind the, the kinds of portfolio that you would recommend to me to invest in the crypto, right? Yeah. Would it be mainly like media advertising related, so I could understand it, mm. or yeah. or like it's up to your expertise oh i think that supply chain there or like based on your experience because you oversee a wide range yes of crypto, okay right? so i know i know where you're coming yeah. from so uh i'm sorry we don't i we don't customize solution like i say oh, okay so coming you coming to me it doesn't matter what industry you're in because i'm not going to be working with you mm. to this to um to decide where to put the money Oh, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to say that. Hey, you know, JJ, you are from the media industry. Tell me about the media industry so that I can invest in media. Okay. It doesn't make sense in that way. Uh, you come to us bef- and it's because you trust our knowledge in the space. You know, we know what's best and we invest in what we know best. Mm. So you coming to us with the money, we have full discretionary to where to put that. Oh. But of course, we will share with you the strategy. Mm. Like this is how we are going to put your money. And you can expect this amount of returns, this amount of risk, this amount of growth, and uh, we will report that to you on a monthly. Uh, so strategies will depend on the risk appetite of the clients. Let's say. No, it know. depend on my risk appetite. Your risk appetite. Yeah. What so what I'm trying to sell you now will be, mm. uh, this is what I think works the best for the industry right now. Mm. This is the amount of risk that you need to be able to withstand, mm. and you need to figure out if this is something for you. Because I'm not going to adjust my strategy based on my cool. individual investors. I think that's very similar to actually my line of advice. Yeah. My line of advice is more media related. Yeah. So for your how do you have, is this your first company that you have entered since? Uh, yes. So I first joined as a trader. How, how do you even find about this company? In the oh, they actually came to SMU to find. Oh, they came to SMU. Yeah. So it was like the found. Are you the found? You're not the founder, right? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, Clarence and Sophie don't want to mention my partner. Founder and so co-founder went to S- SMU. Yes, and then uh, they, they 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 found me. I joined the company as a trader. Uh, so we were trading, and then we have shift. And my background is. Sorry, can you just share uh, share with me what do you do as a trader? Ah, okay, okay, okay. So I think uh, uh, there are a few things that a trader does. Mm. So maybe you heard of traders in a bank. Yeah. So what does the traders in a bank do? Bank basically is what we call sell side. They 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 help uh, perform like services for clients. For example, you say that hey, uh, I want to buy one thousand share of uh, Netflix because I really like Netflix and I want to buy one thousand share of Netflix. Oh. Uh, you call up a trader in the bank. They will help you do that. Mm. They will help you execute at a good price. And that is a trader mm. of a bank. Uh, what we do here, uh, we, we call it a prop trader. Prop trader takes position, meaning we say that, hey, today we are going to buy 1,000 shares of Netflix because we think Netflix is going to go up and I execute that trade. So, uh, and my, my company is more like a buy side. Uh, buy side meaning we 
we are not executing on behalf of anyone. Mm. We think that Netflix is going to go up. We want to make money. We buy Netflix. Mm. Yeah. So you can see the difference right there. Mm. So I'm more You're not taking to, orders. La. I'm not Based taking on orders. your own market uh, intelligence Outlook. reports. Yes. Your, the homework that you guys do. Then we do take, we take the trade. I mean, like your company, everyone's pouring money into this cup technically. You just yeah. have to make it grow and grow and grow. Exactly. And that's how the company makes money. Correct. Correct. And uh, that's what I've been doing when I joined uh, Queen mm. uh, last year, May. Mm. And joined as a trader, I uh, was really actually learning uh, a lot of stuff about the crypto space, continuing to learn, although I've been trading crypto a little bit myself, but it's really, you know... Get H- hardcore trading, right? Like, yeah. it, like Because you keep buying so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, buying and selling. So I think maybe one important, just sidetrack a bit, right? Mm. Uh, a tr- what is the difference between a trader and an investor? Mm. Um, some someone great once told me this, and I never forget. So like, I hopefully mm. you won't forget after this as well. Mm. Uh, a trader, an uh, investor buys mm. and holds stuff because I invest in a company, right? Mm. I invest in something that I really like and I hold it, mm. right? When you want to sell, is another thing. But a trader goes long, which is buying, and goes short, which is selling, like as an equal percentage of the time. Mm. They don't invest in the company, they trade a company, which is, I'm selling this stock, right, because I think this this stock is gonna go down, for example. So I go on short, I mm. sell the stock. Mm. I can go on long and buy the stock if I think the stock is gonna go up. Mm. But an investor don't do that. Investor only buys and invests. So that is the main difference. You gotta figure out who you are. Mm. Do you look for a place to place your money with companies, with with real estate, with bond, you want to invest in that or you want to trade that? Mm. Meaning you're looking at the price charts every day and be like, mm, I think people are going to sell off, so I will sell. Mm. So you need to figure out. Mm. And what uh, I like to do is trading. Mm. So that is more in tune to what I've been trading. So I've been trading Forex for a while now mm. and I figure out this cryptocurrency thing mm. uh, in, in that. So that's what you hear on, online people call technical analysis mm. of like for trading and stuff like that so that is the main difference between like trading and investing okay yeah so changing gears right can i uh, i just want to ask your general opinion of uh, financial advisors because for myself i've been reading a lot i'm uh, reading a lot on investing because you know that like investing uh for retirement, all that kind of stuff is a very important thing. Composite yes. interest, it all makes a lot of difference. So I have a lot of financial advisor friends that comes to me and tells me of, of all these kind of investment and dormant linked policies. And from the books that I've read, at least, right, they would strongly recommend to for you to at least gain a basic understanding of investing of what assets to put your money into, whether it's S and P five hundred index funds, bonds, equities, crypto is one asset that you can put into. So um, yeah, what's your general thing on financial advisors? Okay, so um, I think f- it's important to be invested because of inflation, mm. right? Because if you put your money in a the bank, they're not going to give you interest. Mm. Your money gets burned very slowly because uh, inflation is where the products uh, increase, has a sustained price level increase. Mm. So your money is worth less every year. Yeah. Okay, so if you don't invest, your money is probably not going to be protected and mm. putting in a bank doesn't generate enough interest for you to do that. So, um, back to your point of like financial advisors to me i don't think it is very difficult Mm. for someone to understand compounding Mm. firstly and it's not difficult to gain like a sort of knowledge of the very basic investing for example like you mentioned invest into indexes Mm. what are indexes for people who do not know that there are a list of companies that are uh, probably ranked by whatever metrics that you have so basically Often in that list of companies, for example, we talk about the S&P 500, will be the top 500 companies in the US. They bundle it together and call them the S&P 500. Mm. And buying to that, you get comp- you get exposed into like real estate companies, telecoms company, big consumer like Walmart, mm. uh, Apple, this kind of company. Mm. So you're buying into a list of companies. You're mm. essentially buying into the US economy. Yeah. And according to the numbers, if you have consistently invested in that, uh, I think that nets you about an annualized return of 7% yeah. over the end. That seven percent grows if you are if you have the discipline to do that, mm. and if you are, you are comfortable in investing in yourself, I would think that one should do that. Mm. So, do we need financial advisors? 
Yes. I think that is a question that you got to ask yourself. Do you have the discipline to save money? If not, buy a saving plan, mm. right? You need someone to save money for you. Mm. But again, think of financial advisors as like providing a service. Mm. Once you are lazy and you don't want it to do on your own, you are paying a fees. Investment link products you mentioned of um, all agencies comes with them policy fees, comes with it management fee. <laughs> comes with it the fees that you got to pay your advisors yeah and all this adds up and it's into your what the seven percent that you could have just invested in the us by yourself by yourself so if you are worried that but i don't know how i really don't know how to start investing I think that's bullshit. <laughs> that <laughs> to is, me to me you know. that is lazy <laughs> yes <laughs> that means you are it's not difficult right to to sort of do that uh but i think maybe if you can go a little bit deeper if you if it's too deep then maybe you can stop me right no 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 go yeah ahead, go ahead. yeah is people are saying that hey you know it annualized seven percent but there are years where the funds are down yes for example and you will feel like oh my god am i doing something wrong mm. so i think that again takes discipline and research and you're doing your homework to know that business cycles happen this is part of the process and if you buy into the u.s economy uh which you know obviously you have read the news you know that there is the the crisis in 08 and 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 you know many other mini crises along the way but the market has proven itself to be uh i think tony robbins said it unshakable <laughs> oh, yeah. have you read the book yes okay. it, it it teach you about investing and compounding and, and, and doing that, that was the book that I read. yeah so oh. it, he makes it very simple for you yeah right I mean, I, because that was one of the books that i read like wait this makes sense yeah it, it's, it's called sense. unshakable by tony robbins I read the, actually i read the other one the master the money oh the yeah 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 the very thick yeah. one so 700 correct pages, correct oh God, yeah. and you you know what's the best part you don't even have to do what jj did you yeah. read unshakable which is probably like 100 plus yeah it's plus. a much more concise yes point. and you get the concept mm. right and frankly speaking if you buy an investment link product in like a from a financial advisor they do have down days they do have down years because you're still buying into a fund yeah right so why not invest yourself right that's my take on it all right obviously a lot of people say i'm not comfortable with money mm. i'm an entrepreneur i have run my own business i'm good at what i'm doing and i want an advisor to tell me what to do i want an advisor to show me what kind of they want a service mm. then go for it mm. right but to me the important thing is to figure out the fees that you're actually paying for that service and whether it's and striking the balance of whether do you need such service i mean if you put it into numbers right i because i read this book like quite a couple of years ago yeah so the difference that we are talking about in these fees, right, when, when it amounts over 30 to 40 years, right, is at least hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is that right? Or it, yes. it depends. Yes. yes. I, 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 okay. So, you know, you know, a financial advisor like to come to you and say that, hey, do you know that by saving, uh, you know, this amount, every month, is it? 500 every month, and then, you know, you put 25 years with us, you know, there's a typical savings plan, you are netting about 3 4%, you know, a year, and then you compound it. You can reach this about hundred thousand, two hundred, like a few hundred thousand, depending on how much you put in, obviously yeah. your principal. Yeah. But if you just think about that, that concept, right? If giving you three, four percent a year could generate that big amount of money at the end of the day, right? If you are paying that amount of percentage in fees to them, that justify the amount of money that you are actually paying for this service, and it could amount to hundred plus thousand dollars. It could, right? It could because of the size of your. Uh, we call it asset under management your aum right the bigger you take the policy fee is a percentage of this aum mm. and i'm not i'm not speaking for all uh, investment link product or for all the agencies out there just from my knowledge that i've been reading up uh, some stuff and i do have my own financial advisor mm. uh, talk to me before mm. and i do see these policy fees that you know could add up to a lot to a big amount mm -hmm. whether or not i can answer is it hundred thousand two hundred thousand it depends on your principle it depends on your aum mm -hmm. but if it's charged by a percentage amount you, you could add up to a big 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 amount yeah so would you i know this is like something very biased but would you advocate for people to invest by themselves and if so where can it start from i will i i actually i will strongly advocate people to invest in this, like by themselves by themselves not in oh. themselves okay you should invest in <laughs> yourself too you should do that but uh you should invest by yourself mm. because i think learning about the markets learning about how to invest is a very good knowledge and skill set you have mm. and um for example you are buying into the u.s 
S and P five hundred, for example, you have some skin in the game. You will want to probably follow the Trump and China trade wars, right? And that gives you knowledge, you know, about what's happening around the world. And you once having skin in the game, you will you will be more motivated to find out more. So that's on the knowledge part. But again, investing is to beat inflation, is to grow wealth. Uh, people have different goals. Some people say that okay, I don't care about investing because all these kind of small percentage don't matter to me. My my aim now is to become good at what I'm doing, which is, it can be entrepreneurship and, and other businesses. Mm. And once I build their wealth through business, I want to learn how to preserve my wealth. Mm. So that's a different goal from growing wealth, using investing mm. and preserving wealth. Mm. Right? So the again that, that strategy will be very different. Mm. But it, you you must still invest. It, mm. Is it now when you want to grow a wealth or is it in the future when you're trying to preserve your wealth? So why not start now? Yeah. Right? And if you are investing to grow your wealth the power of compounding works only at the later part of the years. Mm. When your AUM that you have been investing starts to grow, and that same percentage, 5% of $100, 5% of $1,000, then 5% of $100,000, it is going to grow. Mm. So I will really strongly advocate everyone to start now. Mm. And to be honest, the online um, resources are adequate and Online enough. resources meaning YouTube, Google, Anything. Or is there any specific uh, platform that you would recommend? Um, Unshakable. I mean, oh. it's, I think it's a good book to learn about compounding, to learn about uh, passive investing, as we call it, because you don't have to actively look at the markets. Mm. You you just invest, you know, religiously into into something that you mm. believe in, mm. like the U.S. economy. Or if you don't like that, you can invest in the China economy, which every every country has their indexes. Singapore, we has the STI. Mm. So if you like the Singapore economy, uh, do your homework to see. Uh, what kind of returns you can get, uh, you know, over an average mm. uh, over the past 20 years. And this is, remember, not a short-term thing, mm. right? You are investing to grow your wealth and you are investing in the economy of a, of a nation that has been proved, that has proven to work. Mm. And you have the discipline to do that. Because once you don't have the discipline, I think you'll be better off with your advisor mm. that, you know, sort of uh, meditatorily takes the money out every month mm. to invest for you. Mm. But... You are paying for that, mm. yeah. it's, it's better than having nothing at all. Um. Yes, definitely. Because I feel like if you, I, I really advocate investing. And if you don't want to invest, you know, it really doesn't hurt to find out more about investment link product. Mm. But I guess from a person from my perspective, I would think that the fees are really ridiculous. Maybe not <laughs> necessary. <laughs> a, little <bit. laughs> a little bit difficult. Like again, you want to earn money from the market, which so is super competitive already, and you still want to pay people to do that. Mm. Um, if you this is your approach, mm. but then I mean, if you have been a very active listener, then and you are thinking actively, then be like. Hey, but you are fun. You are asking people to pay you fees of two percent to manage your money. Yes. Yeah. So I think if you have been following it, be like, then that doesn't make sense. Why? Why do I need to pay you if you have been advocating mm. passive investing? Mm. And that is, and then it goes one full, full circle, circle back. Oh. I'm trading. Mm. I'm not investing. Mm. When I'm trading, I go in and out of the market because I know what I'm doing. And with the promise of uh, my track record and what I'm, what you can expect. And what I'm trying to do here is to outperform the market. Mm. Meaning, I can do better than you putting your money passively in S&P, in S &P and everything. Yeah. Mm. So again, that's, that, that's what all funds try to do. They try to outperform. Mm. And that outperformance then is sort of justified by some fees that are, that are given to us. Mm. So the, 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 the key difference, maybe just one last point of why financial advisors, I won't really look into that, is because they are not trained to trade and invest. They are selling you products of Great Eastern, for example, Prudential or AXA. I just got to throw in all the names. <laughs> <laughs> so that- Oh uh, gosh. Yeah, so, yeah, so they are not uh, super finance savvy, financial savvy. I mean, that's in my own experience as well. I mean, that is the reason why I went to read the book in the first place. Because yeah. when I came to know about this, when I talked to my financial advisor, she didn't know, like, when I talked about, I was thinking of money, I was thinking of putting my money in index funds, maybe yeah. the S&P 500, ES3, STI. And she had like no idea what I was talking about. And that really struck a chord with me. Like. And that is, um, if I can say, very gross. You yeah, know that's why? That's disgusting. That's disgusting because if she's trying to sell you an investment-linked product, yes. do you know what's in the investment-linked product? They are funds. 
there are funds like that that you can invest yourself. Yes. So why am I paying you to do something that I can pay my, that I can do it myself? Mm-hmm. But uh, maybe we could just be a little bit more optimistic <laughs> yeah, about yeah, the please, whole. So, so, <laughs> once bitten twice shy because I was I personally lost a lot of money from that. That's yeah. why I was a little bit uh, triggered in a sense. Yeah. So I guess there are financial advisors that I do know of. They are very informed. Yes. And they they do really know what they are trying to sell you. Yes. Definitely. And. They know that it is a service mm. and they know that, that the barriers to entry to investing for a lot of people is quite high. Mm. So they, they are providing that service for you. So there's nothing wrong with that. And, and there's if, always a fine line because sometimes I meet financial advisor friends. I feel yeah. because I mean when we are talking among friends, right? Wow, I really need to get a commission. If they give me just 500 bucks per month, right? That's yeah. 2,000 commissions for me like, in a single month. And I can close up to just six people per month. That's about 18,000 of commissions per month. Oh, that's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have friends that close that much, you know? But like when I hear them speak, I mean, of course, I have financial advisor friends that are really like super passionate. Yeah. They know their shit. And that's the financial advisors that I really respect. Yeah. But I feel, at least for my personal experience of having bitten myself, right? I yeah. feel very frustrated in a sense. Yeah, right? because of the underlying that the barriers to entry of becoming a financial advisor is not high. Mm. So for example, you want to get a, a, a job at a bank, a job like what uh, some of us do, that mm. trade with a fund. Mm. Uh, there are interviews that you got to go. There are things that you got to pick up. There are hard skill knowledge. Mm. And for financial advisors, sadly to say that, I would think that the barriers to entry today are not super high mm. because it's a very sales driven approach. As long as you can sell, you know, why not, right? And as long as you believe in, uh, if this is, even a bit far fetched, like even as long as you believe in insurance, which is they say insurance is good for people. So if you can sell insurance, it's good, mm. right? Uh, that's why we, has, we we see so many uh, advisors out there today, and it's a it's a game on numbers, right? By the law, of large number. If you have such a big sample size, that there tends to be people who are mm. not up to standard. I guess that's your experience. Uh, can I ask, like, in terms of the time duration in for you to perform for clients in Queens, right? What yeah. kind of uh, durations do you guys uh, work in? Like because you are saying you're always you always need to outperform the market yes, in yes. a sense like outperform index funds. If not why would they be paying you in fees in the first place? Correct. Right? What is the usual time horizon? Because I'll think that requires some time or it really depends on the clients i want let's say i don't know if you have very like old clients like 70 year old clients I, i'm not sure yeah okay i guess my space is pretty young so yeah. my investors are all pretty savvy pretty uh young in oh, a stage. Okay. so so they have a different very different risk appetite they are they know like for example uh, if you are if your advisors is is investing in us for you you should benchmark it against US economy. Or oh, the index fund. The index fund, right? right? If I'm be- if I'm trading crypto, they bench my performance to Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Why not? Because okay. because the question you should ask yourself, okay, why bench it to a to a fund? Mm. Because if you are a fund not. and you are consistently not outperforming S and P five hundred. Why is stopping me from just buying S&P 500? That's right. why that becomes a benchmark. Yes. Right. So the the fund manager pick and hold stocks or or has a manage of like bonds, real estate, gold, commodities, everything to try to outperform the S and P 500 because it's easy for an investor mm. to invest in the S and P 500 by himself. Mm. So for me, I bench against Bitcoin, mm. and I do that on a monthly basis. Mm. So I don't try to outperform Bitcoin every month because. Honestly, the, the uh, my strategy is more towards the medium to longer term. Mm. But I would think that a fair, to answer your question in whole, I would think the one year mark is always very important. Mm. Like, did you outperform the S&P 500 this year? Mm. Did you outperform Bitcoin this year? Mm. And, 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 and that is the question that we all should ask ourselves. Mm. Because if we are not outperforming the market, then Just we should your money the leave market the market. Already. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I think okay. <laughs> changing gears. Yeah. Uh, I've learned a lot about blockchain. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else you want to share specific to this blockchain technology that you think are important for people to know about? I think blockchain is here to stay, mm. but that won't be radical until you see it everywhere. Mm. So let me clarify what I'm trying to say. Is that when you send an email to a, me sending an email to JJ, we talk on social media mm. we, and we chat out on LinkedIn. We don't really know how it works in the back end. Mm. PCIB packets, all these kind of protocols that, you know, these webs are running. We don't know, mm. right? So there are back end services. They are provided 
and those companies that are providing them are actually sort of doing very well. Mm. I think blockchain will be something like that. You won't see it in the live, like in front of you or mm. like radically. It's not like a Uber. It's not like a product that you can use. I think blockchain will be more suited towards the backend enterprise kind of solution. Like mm. IBM will use it. Walmart will use it. Mm. Uh, Facebook. You know, probably you know if you heard of Project Libra, is the own coin that they are trying to come up with. Mm. I think blockchain solution will be in the background running, mm. and what as consumer we will benefit will be lower price, more secure, mm. faster transactions. Mm. So I think it is here to stay, but it's just not that kind of obvious product that you can actually touch and feel. Let's say for me, I yeah. don't really have a thorough understanding of blockchain because yeah. the clients you work with are definitely more. Uh, net worth uh, heavy or okay, basically ri- bas- ri- rich, richer people yeah. for people who have like, just graduated from me yeah. I'm interested in the blockchain field to, uh, how can I go about doing this like you talked about ICOs do I do my own diligence or homework into okay I'll just buy, buy into a few ICOs okay. like what are the kind of generic tips that you give to me as mm-hmm. someone who's not very involved in this industry that is interested to put this kind of asset into my portfolio Understand. So let's assuming that you already know how to invest, mm. because I think that's a if if you are if you have not invested in your life mm. right into equities before mm. forex or whoever thing, mm. uh, I would think that blockchain will not be something that you should jump into, mm. because it's an alternative asset. Would you say it's the icing on the cake? I will say it is that spicy spice <laughs> that you put in at the <laughs> end. <laughs> Correct, because uh, what a lot of people that I'm actually looking at right is that they already are invested. And they want to diversify mm. to into some other things, right? Mm. Why do you want to diversify? Because don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Mm. So they, they, now this new basket called cryptocurrency and blockchain related companies has come out mm. and it might make sense to put some eggs there. Mm. So if you don't have a basket of goods that are like equities, like companies, real estate, bonds, commodities, uh, start with those first. Mm. And so assuming you have those, I have those. Uh, how then do you try to get involved into mm. It's even easier today to, to invest in cryptocurrency than the past few years. Mm. The past few years, you have to, uh, I think, go pay very hefty fees. Mm. Uh, the startup process is very tedious, the verification process. Mm. Uh, but today, it has uh, been refined a lot. It has, the, the whole process is very easy. Mm. You know, creating a wallet for yourself at Gemini. Right, I'm just gonna throw up some random names. Coinbase, that you're Coinbase Gemini. Oh. You know, last time people used to use Coin mm. A lot of things. It's very easy to just search online. How do I get a wallet? How do I start investing? Mm. So assuming you got all that uh, uh, process done, and you say that okay, I'm ready to invest. So what should I start looking at? Mm. I will still think that don't look further than the top ten coins in the market today. Mm. When I, what do I mean by top 10? It's ranked by the market capitalization. Mm. They call it, it's like, how much is this coin as a whole worth? Mm. And uh, don't look past that. Because if you look past that, it's very easy. Uh, it's too risky, I feel. Because those projects that, you know, are top 20, top 50, they are very small projects that, you know, have a much, much higher risk of failing. Mm. So to start by looking at the top 10, uh, understanding what Bitcoin, Ethereum is, and then start exploring what makes sense to you, mm. and then investing to them is, is not difficult. But keep it at 1% to 5% of your entire portfolio. Okay. Yeah, okay. because of the nature of how volatile it is. Very volatile. Yes, and it's not for the faint of heart, right? Yeah. If you are someone who invests in something and you couldn't sleep after that because it's just you know that it's moving, yeah. and you need to look at it, then crypto might not be for you right now. Mm. Uh, but if you are someone who has done your homework and you know that, hey, you know, I've done my due diligence, I think it's fine. Mm. Uh, I can sleep. I, you know, I can, mm, I can function. Then, you know, and, but don't go past more than 5%, 10%. Mm. Yeah. So if you have a, like a, mm, I think for fresh graduate, you were mentioning probably a few thousand dollars to you want to invest. Mm. 5% will be like what? Fifth, fifth. That's not a lot. Yeah, 10% will be like what? $500. Yeah. So if you want to put $500, you'll be like, okay, but uh, but it's very small money yeah. and I, I feel like, but I think uh, what my advice is, you know, using the unshakable kind of uh, context, continue investing in 
all aspects, right? You have five thousand dollars. You are graduating. You are earning money. Set aside a money, a, a, a sum of money that you want to invest, and then religiously put in those assets that you want, mm. and grow your this AUM mm. over time. Mm. And I think that will be much healthier in that you can still focus on what you want to do in achieving out of your own career, which is in whatever industry that you're in, mm. and then you can still you know start investing from young. Mm. And I think that 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 will be. A good gauge mm. of having crypto in your portfolio today. <laughs> Completely switching gears, right? Yeah. You run two F and B stores. Like, how did that story come about? Like, you are doing <laughs> cryptocurrency, and you own like I mean, you are helping out with two F and B food stores. Yeah. What 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 happened? Yeah. So I guess for the listeners out there, I hope you're not bored of my face. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> so okay, so uh, I run an F and B. You know, like a traditional brick and mortar. Uh, store mm. selling zicha and cai fan ah. uh, in Sin Lim Square. Da? Oh, Sin Lim is a basement one, is it? No, so it was it's level two. Okay. Zero two zero one is a unit number. Uh, we 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 sort of like a, I like to call it an eatery house because it's not like a coffee shop and it's not like a restaurant. We are somewhere in between. Ah. Uh, we sell like a uh, economical value food for 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 students for people who who, who likes our food. Mm. And we, I, we took so it's not a new project, so a new idea. The store has been there. Uh, the, the the name of the store is Rice Bowl Go. It has been there for about four years, but we, me and my partner decided to take over the business about one and a half year back, mm. and rebranded the whole thing. Mm. You know, throwing some marketing. Mm. And, and and here we are today to 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 sort of running the the, the both F and B. How do you get into this F and B ah, thing okay. in the first place? So, uh, it was okay. I'll be very honest. It was to really help out my friends, my partners who who really wants to do that. Uh, one of them is an engineer, and another one of it is a uh, uh, specializing in languages. Mm. Uh, so this is sort of like a family business, mm. not direct family, but you know, like the uncles' mm. business. Uh. Didn't want to continue doing that because of some personal reasons. Mm. We they decided to want to take over the store, and all the three of us just love eating Chinese food. Oh, who doesn't? And then, and yeah, who who doesn't right? And uh, and we were very fascinated about the idea of like, eh, hey, maybe we could run an F and B store, mm. right? So I think this startup story is very different from a lot of people who has the underlying passion for the things that they do. Mm. We don't have that much strong of a passion for cooking. Mm. We we do enjoy eating. We do we. The three of us all cook at home, so we we do know yeah. how to cook. So we, but we are no experts. We are no chefs, mm. and uh, we we just thought it was interesting that we get exposed to such thing. So they come on board with me. I'm I'm more towards the business and finance side of things. Mm. So we we decided to come together and say, hey, you know, why not we try running this mm. business? Yeah. So that's how I got into. <laughs> yeah. You own currently own two stores. Oh, uh, we we when we took over, it was one store. Mm. And then we l- very fortunately have mm. the ability to you know open another one, mm. uh, in Maslin area, mm. to, to that's our second store. What are the biggest difficulties, running an FMB business? I think for me, I will speak from my end, which is from the sales, from how you keep, how do you keep your business running, mm. and uh, my partners have very different job scope in this. Uh, I guess from their side of view, which is they are more involved in the operation part. So, excuse me. They are doing it full time. So oh, they're they are doing full time. They are doing it full time. So they are they are in charge of the operations. I'm more in charge of the uh, sort of the accounts, the finance, the sales, mm. and marketing. So the bigger challenge for me, uh, other than have, having to manage my time mm. because of uh, the other job, would be to really craft a marketing plan for F and B. Mm. And because we are not a big fancy company that has the budget, everything has to be very value. Yeah. And it has to really, you know, trickle down to do we really want to do this? It's a lot of opportunity cost if we if something doesn't really work out. Mm. So for me is how do you then sell a coffee shop mm. through marketing? That was very challenging for me, but very interesting. Mm. So uh decided to, you know, attract, we, we sat down, we, we ate all our dishes over and over again. Which one do we like? Which one did our customer like? Mm. And we decided to sort of brand our store. With that particular dish, which is salted egg chicken. Oh, the salted egg trend. And exactly, which is riding on the trends mm. of the markets, mm. listening to your customer, mm. and then crafting a plan to how you want to brand and market your company. Mm. And I think that was the bigger challenge because for F and B is is kind of, you know, people don't really, uh, do that 
it's, 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 it's just tough to, 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 to decide from day one. Mm. And, uh, but that was essential. Mm. But for me, that was sort of like the biggest challenge, mm. uh, running the, the marketing side of f and And coming up with creative content for food, to be honest, is tough. Mm. It's, it's how do you provide value mm. in, in people that are so following you on social media on a food account. Yeah. Do you provide uh, nutrition tips? Mm. Do you provide cooking tips? Do you provide how to eat healthily? Mm. There are ways, but it's challenging. Mm. In, in, in some sense to keep it very enticing for, for and fresh, fresh for and fresh and uh, uh, sometimes they do run of ideas mm. and it's, it's tough to sort of again manage both sides mm. so that is for the uh, running that the, the F&B side and opening a store uh, maybe I could share a story on how thinking on high side we could have planned more mm. because uh, we were once our business started running we were very excited mm. about the business oh you know things are working out the marketing plans are working out everything seems to be okay you know let's open another store oh yeah so uh, it was very exciting times mm. but the uh once and there's a very good book called bleed scaling mm. which uh in short tells you why speed trumps over efficiency Mm. And that is how company like Airbnb, Uber mm. could, you know, scale up so fast, becoming hugely, massively valued companies over such a period of time. Mm. So uh, we were trying to sort of achieve that, but for we forgot something, the underlying that uh, it is the F and B business. It is something that doesn't doesn't strive a lot on feedback loops. It doesn't mean that you have to capture market share like Uber and all. Mm. So there are a lot of fundamental mistakes that I think that we have made mm. uh, while opening another store. And operationally, mm. uh, from manpower side, we have paid the price mm. of being uh, stretched out. Everyone's burnt out. Mm. Uh, it, it is still a very good experience for, for, for the partners and for our chefs and for our workers. But I think that it could have been a more well-planned and thought out and again uh, we were very excited about mm. the business so yeah that would be one advice to people who are actually expanding mm. um, is your business essential or is it essential for your business to capture market share mm. for f b there really isn't mm. <laughs> a market share that you need to be the market leader because yeah. everybody was suddenly love sausage chicken yeah. so you, you got to you know be more grounded yeah and i think that's you really got to question uh, expanding plans. And all this, you know, fresh off graduate, I mean, I'm two years into working now, mm. uh, then it's, it's very good learning. Mm. And I think it's something that I would like to share with people who, who want to think mm. about entrepreneurship as well. Mm. And that is one advice that I wanted to give people. So mm. it's like, it's, it's very exciting that you want to have a lot of side hustle, mm. but like all investments and like all things in life, right? You need to make sure that it's a good bet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like like serious. You need to make sure it's a good bet. Investing or anything in general. Because I yeah, because I see life as not absolute. I see it in terms of expectancy. Mm. Expectancy meaning in the long run, if you are doing things right, you will win. Mm. So I don't see it as like today my this business had to success had to mm. succeed. Or today my this move into mm. investing in Netflix have to succeed. Mm. I just need to make the correct decision and have a good process. Mm. And in the long run, I will win on the overall basis. Mm. Out of 10 companies that I invested in, maybe three will succeed and then three will hit the big, mm. will hit it big. Mm. So it's about that process. Mm. And if you don't try, you will never know. Mm. So the expectancy should let you be able to handle failures. Mm. Because you are not expecting a full, beautiful track record of, hey, I invested in Facebook, look at where it is now, I invested in this. It's through learning and making calculated bets, as I like to call it, mm. that you allow yourself to learn mm. and have a good risk reward, as we call it in our industry. What you're risking every single time is like that, but if you want to, if you have a reward or if you have a winning bet, they call it, then it will in pay the off. In the time horizon is really just so long, like, where you have this. Yeah. space to play with correct and then now you are not stressed mm. now you are not like oh my god my next business has to be big mm. and when you don't have that stress mm. and when you feel like you can you know uh, think rationally and make decisions like calculated decisions mm. uh, I think that is what is more important mm. in, the, in, the, in the longer run of things mm. yeah 
So go, changing gears, right? Back, yeah. back to the F&B industry, right? Yeah. You were saying that you are, you are actually responsible for hiring. No, no, I will, I will be part of the... Oh, you'll the, be part of the discussion. Yeah, discussion. Oh. So maybe one, one simple uh, illustration would be the day-to-day stuff like suppliers or uh, vendors will be sort of like, you know, those who are good. The word, well, my, my partners who are good at this will, will handle it mm. but hiring when it's like dealing with people uh, we are a bit more sensitive mm. so that's when the team will come together mm. so this you know leads me to, to the, the thought that I really wanted to share with everybody is um, having good partners and compatible partners uh, competent partners is really one of the most important thing in starting a business mm. right a lot of people want to side hustle wants to do something at the side but you know, you only have so much time and for me, let's say I have a main job. Mm. How do I then, you know, manage? A lot of me is not on my end, mm. rather on your partner's end. And they need to trust that you are also doing your job mm. when you are needed to. And and this communication uh, tends to fall off when things are not going very well. Yes. That's why I will really think that selecting your partners is the most most important thing about starting a business unless you want to do it on your own mm-hmm. and you have a very good reason why you sh- you can do it on your own and I, I have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs themselves who just alone and they can do it because they work they know themselves best they know they work best alone mm-hmm. and, and they, they instead of partners they like to hire and, and to, to have specialists working for them rather than working with them mm-hmm. so I think uh, figuring out that is the first thing and then like selecting going partners on that. Yeah. How do you choose a good like working partner? Because I like work at least for me, I I've worked, I've tried to start up s- several things as well. When it comes to choosing the right partner, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's difficult, lah. It's, 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 it's so it's rosy. <laughs> you can talk about it, like oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, shit hits the fan, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. obviously, the first thing is it, it will help if you know the person for a long time, mm. and he's not like a friend that you just know for a couple of years. Mm. Well, my partners, we have known each other f- since 13. So that's, I 13 think. 13 years old. Yeah, so that's probably 13, 13 14, <laughs> 13 years 13, of. 13, 14 yeah, years, yeah. Of uh, th- 13 years of relationship. I think knowing a person f- for a longer period of time it certainly helps. But I guess you, 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 you must have also heard of a lot of stories of how uh, businesses with friends in the end fall out yeah. very badly and mm. then you lose the business and you lose the friend. Mm. So I think it's very important to sort of strike that balance that if this person is, is some somebody very very close to you then my advice is probably not mm. because businesses fail and they fail most of the time mm. and if you think that that is going to dent your friendship or relationship with that person then don't look at it and you tend to be a little bit softer mm. when it comes to fr- working with friends and work and that is the sheer hard fact mm. no matter how good you think you are at yes. managing that there yeah. is still that line mm. as a friend is coming to you he said today he's tired you tend to give him a little bit more slack mm. than other people mm. so you got to really strike that balance mm. uh, but again with friends then you have trust mm. you have a lot of things that uh, is very important in your relationship as well mm. but i would think that uh, as a person who has worked who has been working and who is starting has started something i think it's very important to find a person with that goal the same goal and I'm not talking about a goal of like oh, I want to make one million dollars by 30 years so you know that kind of goal yeah. it's like tangible goal in what you are trying to sell mm. and having that same vision and mm. although it's very uh, cheesy that for a few people to sit down and then really talk about what's the vision for this company mm. and what's the thing but this cheesy process right makes you and the person sit down and really think about it. Mm. I think a lot of people rush into things. You don't leave it to chances where there's a difference in vision because yeah. the slight difference. Because the slight difference in vision, like you said, mm. it, it could deviate very hugely in the future. Yeah. Oh, as, and it could be even for businesses who, when you start running and then they, they're picked off, they run so well that you can't even catch your breath. Mm. So at that point in time, if your vision for the company is not clear, the problem that both of you are trying to solve might be different from the start and stuff like that. That's when you will start to really feel the pain. Mm. So having the balance of that, you know this person for, for, for a good few years, you know he's capable, maybe from school, from many of you who are listening from, from school or like when he just started working, mm. you know, you roughly know how he, he, his working style is like. Mm. doesn't have to be similar mm. as long as he's competent. Then go into the process of that 
what do you both want to achieve and setting goals and vision and this kind of thing that when you are learning in school you'll be like oh this is such you don't bullshit. appreciate it as much you don't appreciate it because you are not setting up your own company you are learning in like they say that vision is important leadership is important Th- this kind of thing don't click airy fairy yeah but it's that important man <laughs> yeah but it is important it helps you stay grounded and you know if, if if this helps right if anything happens right for both of you to go back to that reference point mm. And it's easy to sort of lose yourself. And I, I think I did do ha- that happened to me when I decided to open the new store. Mm. We wanted to, you know, take over, learn how to run the business for you no, know, we were mentioning it briefly that learn how to run the business for a few years before expanding. Mm. Well, when the things start running, you start <laughs> the, your 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 brain starts telling Actually, you different your brain starts telling you different kind of information. Okay. I, I'm, it's not saying that it's not good or it's inaccurate, mm. but if you if we had that reference point. Mm. That hey, we are just figuring this out and maybe this don't last because we were we, we, we were lucky. Mm. We caught on a trend. Mm. So it helps you stay grounded. Mm. And without that that sort of reference point, mm. it's easy to, to sort of like lose yourself a bit. Mm. Yeah. So that helps you choose your partner. Mm. Going back to that initial yeah. question that we had, that helps you choose your partner in terms of if the person can't sit down and talk to you about this and be like, No, 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 I think we should focus on product right now. I think I think we are Mm. Maybe he's not the person that you want. I, I like how you always say maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. not like because absolutely. I don't like absolute. <laughs> yeah, answers and I, like I told you, uh, we were talking about it. Like I like to see everything in terms of like expectancy. Mm. When I do this, uh, it's never a I will confirm make money from the trade. Right, mm. this is gonna confirm make me twenty percent. Mm. Again, the seven percent that we have been giving you for like in passive investing, those are average number analyzed over 20, 30 years, forty years, fifty years of data. Mm. Those are average numbers because in life there is no absolute. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's why you can even mention like even though from my style, I like to say maybe mm. highly possible mm. that we can achieve this. And I think if we tend to look at stuff with like possibility, you tend to be able to accept failures a little bit better. Yes, but must be also not naive to know that you know, maybe you're making some mistakes mm. and, and, and but you know see life is like more like a long game and yes. like expectancy kind of mm. kind of thing you mentioned that you think uh, I think you briefly mentioned that if uh, Gary Vaynerchuk said that oh, now entrepreneurship is really overhyped everyone yeah. is like doing it and perhaps some people that might not be suited to be entrepreneurs are yeah. just doing their own stuff yeah. and you're saying that this is the best time to do it. Yeah. Why? Yeah. So if you have been following uh, Gary, you know that he's saying that we have been very lucky over the past year, past 10 years. You know, everything is in like the bull market. Everything is working well. Mm. If your business is not making money in the past few years, you probably yeah. suck. <laughs> yeah. Right? He, he likes to say this kind of thing. Uh, what I like to think again, uh, sticking to my long game, right, is now we are young and you are still young in like let's say you are graduating and stuff like that it's easy to compare yourself with your the investment banking friend who is making ten thousand dollars a yes. month and feel bad about yourself yes but to me uh this is the from an econ's term <laughs> right opportunity cost <laughs> is the lowest right now mm. in two years time for example you you land yourself a job a three thousand dollar paying job or four thousand, five thousand mm. doesn't matter. Let's treat the number as X, right? <laughs> if X increases by this amount of percentage in two years time, mm. that's gonna make it harder for you to leave. Mm. And in five years time, um, by society norms and culture, probably you you will start thinking about having a family mm. or making your first big investment into something. Mm. Those will need capital and money and time mm. and at that point the opportunity cost will be huge for you to start something and that is what i meant by i think now is the best time it's not in the uh, format of the macro environment in terms of like the the space that we are in or the industry are booming and the countries are doing well it's not in in fact we are not doing well in those aspects like we have trade war tension we have the hong kong protest we have the brexit so the world is not in good shape but you are in good shape because you are young Mm. So an opportunity cost is low. Then now that if you try and if you fail, um, it's it's so much easier to pick yourself up mm. now, mm. and have uh just choose your battles very carefully. But if you do have that thinking of like, hey, maybe I want to be an entrepreneur. Don't tell yourself that. Let me find a job first, and then five years later I will think of something. Mm. You won't. Yeah. <laughs> I will promise you. 
you won't mm. right for me i had a chance to to work in the financial uh in the traditional firm with traditional firms mm. uh, but i chose crypto i chose blockchain i chose to run my own thing is because i think that now i have the ability to just absorb as much as i can mm. and if i do fail then you need to not be naive and also tell yourself that hey maybe you're not suitable to be an entrepreneur mm. like what gary said mm. uh, but you know i would like to s- find out for myself do it yourself instead of yeah. just not just shutting out yeah. the opportunity and if you float right uh, float meaning like you just think that five years later you will have a business uh, when opportunities are so opportunity costs are so high uh you will just float <laughs> yeah you just it's and difficult it will to go against the current once you're already flowing with it. Yeah, and then you will always have this regret. And some people can live with that re- can live with this regret. Like, oh, you know, I always wanted to start the cupcake shop, right? And uh, nah, it's not. It's just not tangible. Mm. It's just maybe not feasible at this moment. Mm. It won't become easier. That's the only thing I'm saying. It won't become easier to set up a cupcake shop in two years. Mm. In fact, it gets harder because you are doing other stuff right now. There won't be that right time. Yeah. So that's why the right time was yesterday. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Oh. so no, yeah, and that is why you should just get started. Mm. And but don't rush into it. Mm. Um, but have tangible timelines. I like yeah. to say that. Don't rush into things, but have tangible timelines. Meaning a lot of people are saying that, hey, you know, I want to be you know, I want to do this by this date. I want to you know, start start to plan properly, give yourself some leeway mm. and and but start planning. And mm. start writing like okay by probably the next month, I want to know at least what product I can sell. List them down. Mm. I want to know what market I'm targeting. List them down. Mm. These are the potential partners that I can list them down. Mm. Once you list them down, by give yourself another a few days to to ration, uh, internalize it and start calling those people who have you have listed as partners. Mm. So this is what I mean by don't rush into things like oh, uh, I just want to start something tomorrow. Is also oh, the first step is actually finding partners to work with. If you don't, if do you it, don't yeah. want to do it yourself, mm. because I feel like that's very important. Mm. So you know, like partners to work with, do they have the same idea? You know, you have to float the ideas to them. Uh, you know, bounce Convince the idea. Them, bounce so them. don't, yeah, it will take time, and this can happen with your eight to five job. I've been doing it for two years. I know it can. Mm. <laughs> so this can happen, and just plan accordingly. And once you have this timeline of tangible things that you need to do, the things will move. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. It will move because you checklist. Have, yeah, I need to talk to person A today about the thing. Mm. Send me a text. Hey, mm. you know I have this idea. Mm. If the person doesn't reply you in a week, <laughs> he's probably somebody that you don't want to work with. <laughs> probably right? Not. Probably not interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but okay, so that's like the level level one, right? Mm. Float to person B, and the person B is so excited. Mm. Probably you also want to take a step back. Too excited? Why are you so, Too, so excited? Yeah, so may, may, but maybe an ex, but a excited person is always better than a non-reply, <laughs> right? So go through that list, and then you know start you know forming ideas with the person, and then if if it can bounce off very quickly, then your timeline can change. But have a tangible timeline mm. of what you want to achieve by the end of the week. I always have that because it's very easy to. To float around, mm. right? Uh, oh, let me let me do that uh, Facebook ad today. Mm. Mm, maybe tomorrow, you know. Maybe yeah, tomorrow. the kind. This, <laughs> yeah. So, what are the kind of things? What are the kind of checklists have you created? Like, what specifically are you working on right now? As, because I actually I know you have really a lot on your plate. Really, yeah, right? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for now, is this the current moment where you're just doing what you're doing, or there's no other new things that are coming on board? Uh, so. Again, you see, I'm also the a victim of digressing. Uh, right? I mean, we all I, are. We all are, and I think it's 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 good to be able to forgive yourself, mm. and then but move, move yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And, and and continue moving. So, uh, for my main job, obviously, is is really really acquiring that technical knowledge. I'm mm. learning coding as well. Mm. So really, still building up the a te- a technical hard skill set. Mm. I think that's very important for young people, mm. and and then you know still looking out for the market, still looking out for opportunities, keep doing what the normal business and usual stuff for the mm. crypto space, mm. uh, going for conferences. In fact, uh, this week is the Singapore FinTech week. So it has oh. been super busy. Mm. Uh, people were showcasing their technology. Mm. People are very excited about 5G. Yeah. You know, a, a, a lot of new things that are coming on board. Uh, so that again opened my perspective horizon of like meeting new de- meeting new people and a kind of oh. yeah meeting new people and having to hear what they think about the crypto space what they think about the blockchain space mm. to be honest compared to the two years ago if the number has came like 
way back down mm. but like what Warren Buffett has said that you want to be greedy when other people are fearful mm. and you want to be fearful when other people are greedy mm. so the, when the market is all time high that's probably you should take a step back mm. uh, when the market is very fearful that's, all when, in. <laughs> that's when you have a chance to to to, to maybe <laughs> Uh, find something that people are not willing to look at because of the state of the market, mm. right? So uh, for that, it's always learning new stuff, and mm. especially with tech, it gets the turnover is very fast mm. of information. Mm. Uh, so that's that for the for Queen. Uh, for my F and B, will be really crafting a long. Since I I told you that the mistake that we have sort of made mm. uh, of not you know having that long term goal of what we want for the business mm. uh, we, we we sort of like really wanted it to work so we we, we focus more on operations focus more on like the supply chain stuff we, mm. or a lot of operation stuff but i think for now it's time to take a step back mm. to realize what we do want to achieve as partners mm. uh, out of the business mm. your interests can be a priority to be honest in the setting of business mm. but make sure that they are aligned with your partners that they don't conflict so an example is for example you you're, you're really it can be i want to make a lot of money mm. nobody is going to fault you for that yeah. but how are you going to achieve that are you going to achieve that at the cost of something else meaning hey let's all pump in another hundred thousand for example mm. numbers is from the sky <laughs> hundred thousand right and why because you want to buy more machine i want to hire new help new people i want to open new store mm. does it align with your partner goals of expansion so quickly or like mm. oh like rice bowl go to be like a local brand that everybody thinks about wow you know so you need to align this kind of thing and uh with every reward comes with risk mm. so that's why if there's anybody that's offering you like a you know 100 percent guaranteed money money back uh, i'm not talking about shop deals <laughs> uh, like a investment kind of deal probably you got to think a bit harder mm. about whether is that just a good deal mm. right because i've been Trading for a while now, running my own business, risk come with reward. Mm. Reward comes with risk, right? It's it's the same like they, they are together. No matter how you want to separate them, like oh, are you you must be thinking oh, I want reward but I don't want risk. Mm. That's almost impossible mm. unless you are providing a service. Mm. If you are providing a service, there's still risk of like the operational kind of risk. Mm. But as long as you are providing a product or something that people like. Uh, it might not come with that risk that you got to take. Mm. What I'm talking about is like investing in the businesses. Mm. There's those, if you want greater rewards, comes with that risk. Mm. And and it's important to realize that expectancy game again, mm. that you want to make sure that your reward is always bigger than your risk. Mm. So out of 10 times, mm. let's say you can win five times, you want the reward to be more than one is to one. Proportional. Yeah, proportional. So that you can win in the overall game. Mm. And that should be the aim of, of what we are trying to do here. Mm. Yeah, on that note, right? Uh, changing gears a little bit in terms of like Gary Vaynerchuk, is there any other influences or idols that you absorb content from, which you think has helped you shaped into who you are today? Uh, I think personal mentors are mm. important to me. So my, I'm very grateful for my bosses, mm. for my partners mm. that we are all learning again from each other. Mm. So my boss told me this thing very uh tangible kind of advice. So he said, did. He he. I think he he talked to me about this last year. He said, "Did you know? Yeah, an average billionaire has an like average number of passive income is seven and above. Seven and above. Yes. Okay. So an average billionaire has seven and above passive income. Source of incomes. Source of incomes. Mm. And I know that they are passive. Mm. They are not active where he really needs to go and run around. Mm. So." Uh, this might mean that uh, you know I know this, mm. but think about it. How do you have seven streams of income? It's very tough. Working is one. Yes. And working takes up 70 80 percent of your time. Yes. How are you going to have seven? Mm. That's why I say now is the best time because mm. you are young. Mm. You now you don't have again family, using the concept of opportunity cost. You don't yes. have family. You probably you know, if you're listening, you have a partner with you. Mm. Uh, who maybe if you can understand what you're doing can help you in achieving those goals. Mm. Your friends are still, you know, exploring. Probably your friends, everybody exploring, traveling, grad trips, and everything. Yeah, now what do you feel about it? Yeah, no. I regret it wasn't a fan of. I wasn't a fan of it. Yeah. Okay, no, sorry. Uh, we were okay. Talking about uh, no, no. Uh, seven seven in- average income yeah, streams, seven. right? So 
now is the best time to start thinking how you want to achieve it, right? Okay, but if you say, eh, hey, no, Royal, I don't want to be a billionaire. I don't care about that. Then, yeah, this is not something for you. But this is what my, what my mentor tells me and is having this tangible number, seven or five or four, that you can work towards. Are, these are tangible goals. I mean, at least for me, I also don't really like to have the idea of being dependent on a single source of income myself. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for yourself, how many streams of income do you have right now? If you're willing to share. No, I <laughs> I have a couple. A couple. I'm working on um, some of my main job, my, my side business, and I'm running some other stuff on my end. Mm. Those two trying to make mm. it work. Uh, so, still multiple. So, about three or four. About three. Mm. Yeah. But uh, it can be stable and sometimes it isn't so you can see when you have a when you have a aim and a target right which is like seven stream of passive income mm. then i think to myself ah then my third one is not really considered to be passive because i'm still putting much work mm. eh, i'm actually putting a lot of effort into that uh to my rice bowl business so maybe that's not considered i'm working so when I, actually i have zero passive mm. think about that i have zero passive income you so invest like dividends. Yeah, I'm not sure so you probably those. Uh, yeah, the, the, oh, that's one passive. Income. So that's one passive. Oh, income. So yeah, you, but again, a, a lot of people might be confused along the way. Like, hey, you know, I'm working two jobs, I have two streams of income. But again, going back to the definition, we can guide you to be seven. Okay, then I need to work towards that number. So have your own tangible goal, la. And I think going back uh, to your question is like this is a. Uh, given to me by my personal mentor mm. which is for my, my my partners and are there any people online that like listen to uh, I used to like Tony Robbins a lot mm. uh, but it's just that I feel like I have gotten what I need at this moment from him mm. and I'm, I'm motivated now mm. right so what you need at this moment maybe it is motivational kind of like talk mm. or maybe it is tangible skill sets like you need to go and learn something, right? Skills. You need skills, right? You need hard skills. Mm. Uh, sales is a soft skill, can be a hard skill, uh, debatable, but mm. you know, skills. Mm. So figure out what you want, but don't dive too deep into something. Because mm. I, I've seen people, you know, uh, they say, uh, Gary always say that, don't watch Netflix, uh, you know, do, do stuff, right? Mm. But he will always say, if you want to watch Netflix, it's okay, just be happy. That's his message, right? Yeah. So this message of like, be happy, self-awareness and, uh. and everything is good. Mm. But what good has it got to do with you, right? If you are watching four hours of Gary Vee content every day. Yeah. There's, that is no difference from watching Netflix. Yes, yes. In my opinion, if you are just watching motivational talk and not doing anything, mm. then you might as well be watching a Netflix, movie. Uh, yeah. And Netflix is the same thing. Mm. So, uh, but again, if you're happy, <laughs> you know what? Okay. It's good. Mm. But yeah, just don't say that, you know, you have been watching content, but you are nothing is happening yes yeah so mm. i guess that's what i'm trying to say last gear that i want to reach on okay. right what books do you read oh okay yeah i i don't know whether you are a fan of reading books but it seems that everyone i ask I don't, yeah i'm not sure some people don't read books at all but what are the kind of interesting books that strikes to you as a important? I, I do actually i do i'm read sure books. you have a long list <laughs> yeah uh but i i'm very practical okay i'm not the kind of uh person they're trying to sell you on Instagram that says that you can read 52 books a oh. year uh, <laughs> or something see, like see that. See those ads, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or something like that, right? Okay, before before you are sharing those books, like what is your best form of absorbing those books? Like some people use audio books, or reading, I physical really, books, e-books. What, what's your... What? Physical, physical and I take notes. Okay. So if you have seen me outside, I probably have not. I always carry like still a pen and a highlighter mm. because for me, the best way is to really read and then write notes in, in, the, in the book itself, like oh, small okay. notes, and I'll highlight the book. Mm. So next time, if I ever need, like, uh, for example, I'm reading a self-help book, something mm. like that, mm. I, when I flip it and, and I see those highlighted segments, mm. it gets to me easier. Mm. I don't need to go and search for something. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people think that reading book is very slow because, and in fact, I've been just having this conversation with my friend today, that every book drives a certain concept. And it, it's... For a book to be good, it's probably not driving a lot of concepts. Mm, a few core core messages. concepts. And then you will illustrate a lot with examples 
of how why that core concept works. I mean, like my rationale of that, like why books are written as such, is that yeah. you they are providing you so much evidence in a recurrent manner. That it manner. fits. Yeah, it, 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 it's part of the process. Because yeah. if I tell you the goal, like the, the killer sentence that you need just once, right? Yeah. It'll just stick with you for 20 minutes. But exactly. If, if you're absorbing content contextual to this message for a whole book, which might be absorbed over Correct. a month, is that, is that 100%. Right? Okay. So it differs from person to person. Mm. Uh, if you feel like you don't need to finish the book, mm. don't be pressured to finish the book, right? If you really feel like you understand, yes, performance drives success. This theory, for example, mm. performance drives success and when performance cannot be measured, network drives success, for example, mm. this concept. If you feel like you got it, you got it, yeah. right? And how one tip of maybe, how do you know that you got it or not? Mm try explaining that concept to the brother just beside you. Okay. If you, you okay. can't even say that quote outright, that's the that first. You didn't, you didn't yeah. It. Because it's very easy to read something and be like, oh, that's interesting. Like right. the, the art of thinking clearly. I think there is like at least 20 or 30 <laughs> fallacies uh. that one can make, right? Uh. But what sticks and what matter to you, you don't need to equip yourself with so many of this information. And my brother told me this and I'm very grateful is that it is cool to know uh, and it is, it is important to no, not fall into those fallacies, for example, mm. like the winner's curse, the sun cause fallacy, and this kind of thing. Like a lot of them. Oh. Just some people, very careful, they read, they'll be like, oh, I cannot, I forget already. I need to read again. No, pick what matters to you at the moment. Know of these concepts, they will stick around in your brain for a while. If you really is reading them, then you can move on. Mm. That's why highlighting and making notes is what I like to do. And I like to read a book and think, immediately think how it can apply to my life. Mm. So sun cause theory, I tell you one very concrete example that I, gave, I can give you right now. Mm. If the second store that I opened for Rice Burgo is making my staff very tired, it's not making as much money, I will shut it down because I'm not a victim of sun cause fallacy, which is, uh, sun cause fallacy is something that you think that you have invested a lot of money in it already and you don't want to give it up. So it's sun cause. Mm. The cost shouldn't be part of the equation. Mm. One example would be like, for example, you bought a uh, concert ticket to J. Cho concert or JJ Lin <laughs> concert, right? And you bought the tickets and outside is having a blizzard. Uh. <laughs> like blizzard, raining heavily blizzard. Then you'd be like, cannot, I need to go because I bought, I the, already ticket. bought the ticket. Mm. But if going out puts your life in danger, that's stupid, right? Mm. But people will go. Oh, based on this but fallacy. that is a sunk cost fallacy because you shouldn't even think about the cost of already bought tickets. You should think about, <laughs> you the should dangerous. evaluate the danger and the cost. <laughs> so uh, when you can explain a concept of like sunk cost, like things that you invested in already shouldn't be part of the equation, then you understand this fallacy. Mm. Then you don't need to keep reading examples about it. Yes. And if you can come up with your own example, like I just did, mm. is, uh, yeah, actually, I didn't come up with the example. Of my own. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I think I read it somewhere. Yeah. That's why it's stuck. Like, if you can come up with an example for it, then, like, for my own rice bowl go business, mm. then is, I would think that it's very safe to assume that you can you have mm. absorbed this concept mm. and knows how to apply it in your in your own life and business, then you can move on. So, what other specific books have you read that I think that that you think are worth sharing? Uh. So okay. Even before that, just. I try to read. Oh at yes, least you're mentioning that you yeah. uh, read at least only four books a year, yeah. which I think is very little actually. Correct. So every quarter, ah. uh, three months, I aim to finish a book. So maybe I can explain myself a bit more of okay. why only four books, right? Uh, I think a lot of people try to aggregate their numbers and tell themselves, wow, I read a lot of books. Mm. To me, I like to take it slow and more practical approach because I like to still do other, other stuff. Mm. Reading a book is no different than uh, considering it as like a leisure thing, I feel. Mm. Because it's for yourself, you're investing yourself. Mm. Although it's important to do that, but if you want things to be running, after you have invested in yourself, if it's not health and everything, mm. if there are tangible stuff that you need to do, you need to spend time on doing those stuff. Mm. So that's why I try to keep like reading, like also managing it and not be like, hey, you know, reading is good. So I will just read a lot of books. Yeah. So what kind of books do I read? Uh, the four books, right, uh, come from probably four different categories. Okay. So I don't I don't read uh, fiction. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's, it's nothing wrong with that because fiction, maybe they can drive certain concepts in life mm. or especially uh, in art designing probably it helps. Mm. But I, I do prefer movies on, on those stuff. <laughs> uh, so non-fiction book, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I read one textbook. What? As in textbook is part of the four. Okay. That's, that's why it takes time. Why? So textbook are for technical skills okay. and knowledge. Uh, I like to read about, for example, the, the book that I'm reading right now is the options trading mm-hmm. book. So I like to say that that is a technical, it's, it's like a textbook. They do sell in like university and stuff. Mm. So that is a way for me to learn new ways to make money. Mm. So that is a textbook. So I'm reading textbooks, like really doing those homework exercises. Wow. So that's why it takes a lot of time. And to be honest, I'm not super fast at it. So that, that takes time. That's why that's one of the book. Textbooks is one of the criteria. The second one, I like to read uh, past success stories mm. of how it comes about. I'm reading... Biographies? Yeah. It can be, or it can be like a mix, mm. whether like from a perspective of different people also. So, mm. so sometimes I don't like uh, to just restrict myself. Uh, but right now I'm reading uh, Walt Disney story mm. uh, from the past. And now he's, uh, the current CEO has uh, written a book about his how he managed conflicts, mm. crisis, how he bought over the growing company, mm. uh, Fox, all this kind of thing. Mm. And I'm reading that as one of it, mm. as one of the categories. Mm. Uh, self-help book, I also read that's the third category. Mm. So the one that I'm reading now is Five Formulas for Success. Mm. And again, it is a more data-driven kind of book because there are, this is a very f- nice concept actually. Okay. Because uh, Intangible stuff like success is very hard to measure. Mm. Love is very hard to measure. Okay. So by uh, quantifying, su- that's why scientists couldn't solve love, mm. couldn't solve success because they are non-quantifiable objects, mm. right? So this book that I'm reading try to quantify success. So one very cool concept that if I can quickly share, yeah, right, sure. is that he says that if uh, a leaf, if you drop something in the forest and nobody heard it. It's almost like it's, it wasn't even dropped. Oh, yeah, I think I heard it. Yeah, something, before. this kind of concept. So they, are, they use this concept to success and say that if the success is not measured by your peers and relative success, right, it is not success. Okay. Example given a person that got into a car accident, mm. l- uh, lo- uh, lose the ability to walk, for example, mm. and then went through six months of therapy, you know, that kind of uh, physio, you mm. know, try to fix the leg. Mm. And in a probably a few years time he can stand up Mm. to him is it a success yeah in the book it's not because standing up by society metrics is not a success so that is that attracted me okay it's brutal and that's why i gave that example it's brutal because a lot of people is arguing hey success is what i am if i'm happy i have no money i'm successful you know because i'm happy but the book wants to show you the data-driven approach to measure success, which is relative to people, which Not is you, which is money can be like an important aspect or like they aim to su- study why, for example, players like Cristiano Ronaldo is more successful than an equally skillful player, but it just don't have that kind of success. Mm. So, and we can all know that, we can all agree that Cristiano Ronaldo is successful, mm. but we all actually, would not agree that a person that just stand up from his is successful. Mm. So they, they they use that approach. And that's why this book is very interesting to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of, it, it, as you can see, it's really debatable. Yeah. Yeah. That personal success is not considered as success in the book. And I like this kind of concept because they are interesting and new to me. Mm. And uh, as a fund manager and as a business owner, I also want to achieve measured success by people's standards. Is so this is your definition of success right now? Uh, this is the book definition of success. <laughs> I'm trying to see <laughs> hey. if, if maybe it could fit in mind. I haven't yeah. figured it out. It's to just be honest. opening your mind. Exactly. And reading this it and, and this kind of book. Because this is a it's, a... it's a new concept. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah it's an unconventional thought. Yeah. And it's a... Yeah. And it's, it's when I read the book and it says about the person that suck, that. Uh, you know, got an accident and stand up and start walking. It's not gonna be a success factor. I'm just like, wow, this book is talking real stuff, <laughs> right? You, you know, like you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you know, they are very data driven. So they really study of uh how how do you become a top hit in Spotify? Uh. Uh, they how do how do you do that kind of thing through uh, sampling through uh is ordering. it written in a very academic way? It's not. Oh no, is it? Or that's why. Nice? That's why it's easy to read and. Uh, I think I could maybe you could link the link below. I think it's five 
ways to measure success. Who five formulas. This? Who wrote this? I can't remember. Okay. I read five so formulas many formulas for success. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sure I'll, I'll link it up somewhere in the video yeah. Description. So yeah. So that's one kind of book that I like to read. So as you can see, my books that I read is very different. What's the fourth one? The, this this self help was the third category, yep. right? What's the fourth category of books? So the write? fourth one, I like to leave it open or open. open. Either I can maybe read one textbook. more of like textbook self help or like uh, maybe a documentary style of stuff mm. or the. F- but in fact, what I have been reading, um, the fourth one recently la, for the past two years has been Bitcoin. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah which, so, that's why so I leave it. I leave it open, mm. and. I think there are not many Bitcoin or cryptocurrency oh. books today. There are a lot of telling you, hey, you know, how to invest, but not the kind. Mm. I like to read about the blockchain. And I think the Bitcoin standard is still uh, by far the most, I think it's quite a difficult read because it is te- telling you about Bitcoin as an alternative system of money. Mm. So in order to understand money, mm. it goes way back. Yes, yes. Into when people were using uh, chickens and hens, to, yeah, like butter trades ah. and uh, how he then moved to precious metals, mm. how we got into the gold standard, mm. how the Nixon Dixon uh, the, the the agreement to remove us from the gold standard in 1971, how did it cause the the crisis? Okay, how monetary new money was backed by gold. Yeah, right. You could redeem your fiat paper money mm. for gold by the banks. Mm. Then they they sort of remove that gold standard then right now we have fiat currency mm. which is in fact if you think about it right has a less than 50 years operating history i didn't know that yeah no. we, well, it's just a timeline right no. we went off the gold standard in like 1971 if i'm not wrong uh, i think it's around there then mm, in 1939 is it i'm a bit messy with okay, messed okay. up with the thing. We'll but the out. fiat yeah we'll check it out you should check it out and and that is why it offers like a Bitcoin offers an alternative payment system mm. that is not fiat money. Mm. It's digital. And yeah. everyone is sort of comfortable with sort of this uh, virtual currency thing. Mm. Like digital payment, at least like online transaction. Mm. People are sort of more comfortable Open with that. To it. So you might see the world shift mm. in the future, but again, it's now is the time to sort of really explore mm. the 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 what we can we can we can we can find mm. in, in the for the next yeah, so for the fourth category, mm. cryptocurrencies open, open. Yeah, open, but has mainly be really cryptocurrencies, mm. blockchain, distributed ledger technology kind of book. Yeah. Is there that second book that you would like to share in terms of having a big impact on to your thinking or that has contributed to that is important to you? Right. So uh, is that that second book? I mentioned mm. bits blitz scaling just now, right? It's about building massively uh value company that really measures like success with like using speed rather mm. than efficiency yes so that's just one concept uh bitcoin standard okay but these kind of technical books i won't think that they make a huge impact on me because they are knowledge mm. it's just like how you read no, i would say it still does right yeah I mean, it, knowledge it is power does. yeah in, in yeah, yeah. Place you applied need to knowledge is power yeah. Mm. knowledge oh, yeah, is not power okay, okay. yeah knowledge is useless if it's just at the back of your mind mm. i think i heard it somewhere yeah 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 so Knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is power. Is Tony Robbins? I have no idea. Okay, okay. I mean, I've been reading like so much of this kind yeah. of stuff. So, and I make a conscious effort mm. to remind myself. Mm. Like, that's why if I'm reading a book, right, and even if it's uh, non-fiction, right, a lot of people give themselves the, the sort of like excuse that, hey, I'm reading a book. It's correct. And trust me, like if your parents see you reading a book, right, they will never scold you from young. But if you see, they see you playing games or watching, watching YouTube, probably they will scold you <laughs> from young. But in fact, if you are learning and you got to be honest with yourself that we have graduated, we are going to adult, right? Yeah. You need to know what you are doing. If you are reading, if you are watching Gary V's uh, video mm. just because you like him, that's not, uh, that's a, that's leisure. Value add, yeah, that's, that's leisure. Like, right? That's a leisure, right? For you to enjoy. So when I read book, I try to be the, the same. Mm. Like I try to take away something from this. I read very slowly. Mm. And, I'm, and, and that's why I only gave myself that four books mm. a year. Uh, I, I'm, on, I'm on track to finish that. Uh, in fact, I've passed that. How many books have you read this year? This is already, already in November already. This year, well, I think about six. Six. La. Yeah, about six. It's still not a lot. Mm. I'm still not done with the text work. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I have uh, probably a, a, a one more month mm. to finish that. Mm. 
Mm. And yeah, so I think it is it's good again, me setting tangible goals makes mm. me now I have one more month to finish the textbook. If I don't have this tangible goal, I'll probably not finish the textbook. So mm. I think it's not a numbers game that most people are trying to achieve of reading a lot of books, but rather having this thing that you can really take away. Mm. Like if if it helps the the conversation that we had about the four books, I did mention stuff in it. Mm. Right, that I hopefully take away mm. from reading those books and mm. like talking to me about it is mm. it refreshes the memory and it yeah. solidifies like the content in yourself, yeah, in myself. So, so now I want to figure out when it was ghost and removed. I think it's 1971, hey. I think so, but 1971 okay. seems a bit near. I mm. think it's, yeah, okay. Ending of the forecast, right? Yeah. Well, this is like a two hour, 20 minute forecast, really. yeah, it's pretty long. Uh, no, no, but it's all about, yeah, I, I've been learning so much. Uh, another generic question. If I recently read this in a book, at least I think I watched a video about it. Mm. One year from now, what are the things that will need to happen to you that will make it the best day of your life? Come again? That's like quite, quite, quite a, <laughs> <laughs> quite a yeah. Quite One year from now, mm-hmm. in twenty twenty November, mm-hmm. if next year were to be the best year of your life, what things will need to happen to you to make it the best year? Wow, that's that's <laughs> really that's no, no, yeah. Okay, so firstly, you got to understand, right? Like uh, the person, like probably after this two hours conversation, you <laughs> know that I don't justify in terms things in like absolute, like absolute values and absolute terms. That's why I never had a best mm. in my dictionary. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Because okay, I just if I want to change it, okay, I know yeah, you're right. Because I don't deal with extremes. Okay, like I don't like deal with a sure thing. And that's why I, I, I cannot grasp the concept okay, of uh, best. Okay, if you want me to rephrase the question, yeah. it, one year from now, yeah. if it were to be the slight, one of the most best years of your life. It's like a better year. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Then, then. But, I, no, but I, in my opinion, I think pushing it to the extreme yeah. sets a benchmark in its own. Yeah, and okay. It's like a shooting for the stars and you're landing on the clouds. Yeah. So that, that is the kind of energy. Yeah. So, okay, I mean, going back to the uh, be, original question, it's it's in, yeah. best year of your life, one year from now. What are the things that would need to happen to you, or that you would want to happen? I think this is a deep question, but I mean, just the top of your mind of things that are on your head, the kind of goals that you want to achieve, whether it's for your FME business or the kinds mm. of, or uh, let's say, results wow. that you want to bring to your clients. Oh, I want to bring two hundred percent results. I mean, I, I, I'm okay. just throwing numbers. Yeah, out so there, but I I don't think I can give you a very tangible answer, mm. but in a macro the, sense, in the in a more vague and macro sense, right. It will be the best year of my life, right? If I can figure out what I want for the next five years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, like to be honest, like wow. If it will be the best year if that at the end of November 2020, I know what I want to do and achieve by the end of the next five years. Because right now, right? Right now, right, okay. it is not super clear. I used to have this goal of I need to have five business by 30. Okay. I need to have five businesses by 30 and let, let me go and achieve that. Yeah. So I'm still on track to do that. Mm. And is I'm, that still in the plan? That is now my plan. Okay, and that's I've, cool. And I've been telling people about that. Mm. But recently after, you know, working about it for two months, uh, two years, Just that this student two, do is, is very tiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, it's always a balance, yeah. right? Your friends, if you have a partner, if ah. you have a family. So that goal seems difficult at yeah. this moment. Mm. And it is sort of sh- shaken a bit. And that is why if the n- by next year, November, right? If I can tell myself that, you know, I don't need this five business or if, no, actually I need seven mm. or if by the November 2020, I can figure this million dollar question, a billion dollar question out, right? Yeah. I think it will be the best year of my life because then the rest will be easy. Mm. Achieving 200%, right, will be the best year of your life up until this point. Yes. But that will be overtaken quite easily. If yes. next year you want another best year, another best year. Mm. So that's why it would be the best if I could set <laughs> the next five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, it's quite vague, la, I'm sorry. No, no, but, no, uh, but that, that is another. Yeah, that's why I think it's quite different. From what you're expecting, because it's not tangible. Like I want to have like fifty yeah. million AUM mm. under for my client, or I want to have ten rice bowl goal mm. chain. I think those are tangible goals that can be in the 
in the smaller parts of things mm. but on the very macro and red if i can figure out what i want to do for the next five years and i lock that in this will be the best of my actually that is my that will be the best year of my life i mean that's the question that i'm most asking myself as well because but the, how i justify it to myself is that yeah. Right now, I'm working in Vayner Media, yeah. and I see it as congrats. a learning phase. No, 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 congrats, Sunday, but I really see it as a learning phase. And yeah. that's where I always ask myself, like, down five years, what exactly do I want? Right? I can tell you that I don't know. I exactly. Don't know. I don't know. And right now, at least the trouble I'm facing, like, I'm really just sitting down, like, taking out a nice notebook, write, write, trying to write things down, just writing things down to push me in a direction to be more clear of what I want to do. And that's the biggest challenge that I have for myself. Huh? So if you have the answer to that, won't next year be the best year of your life? Yeah, don't. Yes, yes, you yes. have the same answer as me. Yes, now. yes. Yeah. No, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess maybe some, okay, I, would, I would never say tips mm. to, to like achieve I think <laughs> so right. You're very non binary. I, I like that. Yeah, yeah, I don't re- I really don't like the use words. I think life is absolutely binary. There's always another point. Yeah, I, and I I always take I like to call it rangers rather than like a, if people play poker, like listeners you play poker. I don't like to say things like you have ace king, you have king queen as your hand. I would like to believe that you have a range <laughs> of hands. And I think that is that applies to to life as well. Everything should be in a range. This is base case, best case, worst case, range. What can happen, range. So, uh, just, okay, just to sidetrack a bit, to, uh, not to sidetrack, go back to the main track to talk about that thing, right? Mm. What do you want in five years? Mm. I think for now, if you are working very hard to make things happen on a yearly basis, as long as your, your goal is, is vague, right? I still think that it is okay. Mm. I still think that it is okay, mm. uh, but it, it really helps if you can tell yourself that, hey, by 30, I want to have a million dollars. Mm. Because, right, if one breaks down the number of needing to achieve a million dollars by, fi- by five years, four years, mm. whatever age you are, right, then you will need to know that, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't be spending on this bubble tea. Mm. Because it works down to numbers like that. Having yeah. a tangible goal gives you, uh, oh my God, means yearly I need to bring in a million. Okay, assuming I like need to, how am I going to bring in a million a year? Yeah. Oh my God. And this then that's when you realize that most people throw out. Correct. And that is uh, weird to me mm. because you, you are never going to achieve that. A million dollars by 30, breaking it down, you know that even having this kind of job is impossible. Yeah. And then that's when you realize, oh my God, having a million dollars by 30 is impossible. Mm. Let me try 35. Mm. Oh, now I have five more years. Mm. What are the numbers am I looking at? Mm. Then you can plan. Mm. So, but if your what you want in life is not tangible as like a million dollars, then you can't have this. Mm. Which is why I say that it's okay to forgive yourself and let yourself go a bit of like, if your success is not a tangible thing, then you cannot measure it one. So h- what are you going to tell yourself? Like, oh, like I-, I want to be happy in five, what? Like it's tough, mm. right? So, but if you do want to have that million dollars, then this is the only way. It's like instead to breaking it down in numbers and then achieving it by yearly. I think there's this uh this guy that always drives a Bentley, Bentley in a boss kind of YouTube uh Dan Lok. Yeah, Dan yeah. Lok. He's I think he's one of the key ideas that I took from him is that you break it down to goals, tangible goals, and break it down to what you have to do daily. Mm. Like, oh I wanna achieve this. Yearly I need to do this, monthly I need to do this, daily I need to do this. And then okay. I'll take the idea with me. Yeah, yeah. and tangible and if you are not on track right you will know you need to hold yourself accountable yeah and how many people has like new year resolution and then now like the november already <laughs> right and november already they'll be like oh my god yeah so i for me i post on my instagram mm. like what do i want to see some things that i'm looking at towards the year end and then sort of post it then if it's on social media people can see so mm. <laughs> then mm. you probably yeah need to follow up Right, so for then, I think he lists down, mm. and then if he doesn't, if he didn't finish by today, he didn't finish. Mm. Tomorrow you do lor. If or if not, you track your pattern over like a month. Yeah. And see whether you're being accountable to yourself in achieving the goals that you want. Exactly, and then you can. That's that's when you can know practically whether you are on track to finish something. Mm. And but if you don't have a tangible goal, then that is hard lah. So for 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 listeners out there, if you don't have a tangible goal, mm. uh, it's very easy to float. But if you are happy, then you know it's okay to float. <laughs> yeah, going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I realize, I always realize you 
free me then yeah, yeah, free me another perspective yeah okay Royal thanks so much man it's thanks been, for uh, having me no no thanks yeah. for sharing man. thanks for having me maybe one year later we can have this podcast okay lah maybe you can suit me occasionally but I think it'll be interesting if you can have a podcast one year later if yeah. I'm ever still doing this I really hope mm. I'm still doing it I want to do this right yeah but yeah thanks so much man is yeah. there any last things the camera right there if you want to share any message with the audience if there's even anyone watching but yeah I, I, yeah, I just like doing this in terms of forcing ourselves but if there's anyone watching what would you say to him or her if you are watching this still after two <laughs> hours I think you have a huge amount of greed and discipline to, to really <laughs> or maybe you were enjoying it so much but take away something from this and if you want to do something set a goal tangible goal <laughs> it has to be tangible plan for it and then really just start doing okay thanks so much man thanks for having me thanks man